for a written transcript of this meeting or if you need reasonable accommodations, including this communication in an alternative format due to disability, please contact the Clerk to the Commission's office at 404-612-8232. Testing. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the May 17th meeting of the Fulton County Board of Commissioners. Today is May 17th, 23. It is exactly 10.02 a.m. Madam Clerk, please call the roll for purposes of a quorum. Chairman Rob Pitts. Present. Commissioner Bridget Thorne. Present. Vice Chairman Bob Ellis. Present. Commissioner Dana Barrett. Present. Commissioner Natalie Hall. Present. Commissioner Marvin Arrington, Jr. Commissioner Khadija Abdul-Rahman. Present. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Please rise for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Almighty and grateful God, we are thankful for this day, for your grace and mercy. We pray now your peace and your power upon those who are present. Bless now our leaders. Give them your strength, your guidance, and your wisdom. It is in your name that we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance. Thank you. All right, continue, Madam Clerk. Page two, consent agenda. 230324, adoption of the consent agenda. All matters listed on the consent agenda are considered routine by the county commission and will be enacted by one motion. No separate discussion will take place on these items. If discussion of any consent agenda item is desired, the item will be moved to the recess meeting agenda for separate consideration. Any items on the consent agenda, Madam Clerk? Commissioners, anything on the consent agenda? All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. All right, just a minute, just a minute. All right, is it working? All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Please vote. This is on the consent agenda. 
Please vote. And, and the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Continue, Madam Clerk. On page five, recess meeting agenda, 230333, adoption of the recess meeting agenda. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we have revisions to today's recess meeting agenda. First revision on page five, 230335, presentation of proclamations and certificates. We have a item revised to include a proclamation recognizing Olga, Sh Olga Shoemake Appreciation Day, sponsored by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. On page 11, 230356, Board of Registration and Election. This item is revised to amend the membership description on the printed agenda uh, to reflect the legislative amendments made in 2019. The Fulton delegation does not play a role in the nomination process. Also, Chairman Pitts has requested to substitute the nomination of Lee Morris to serve as chair of the Board of Registration Elections to Patrice Perkins Hooker to replace Kathy Willard for a full board appointment. And that's all I have. All right, on the motion to approve the consent agenda as amended, uh, motion to approve by Commissioner Abdur Rockman, seconded by Commissioner Barrett on the, on the uh, agenda. You want to be heard? Yes. Mr. Chair? Okay, well, you didn't say anything. Um, on this revised, uh, Recess meeting agenda, it says 23-0356, that it is being revised to delete this language. Can somebody explain? Because this is the first that I'm seeing it. 23-0356 is the item where it says, Chairman Pitts has nominated Lee Morris to serve as chair, replacing Kathy Willard for a full board appointment effective July 1st, 2023, to a term ending June 30th, 2025. And then on this uh, last minute revision, it says that we are voting to delete the line that's number three that says one member shall be appointed by the governing authority of Fulton County from nominations made by the Fulton County Legislative Delegation in the General Assembly, which members shall be designated permanent chairperson of the board. The Fulton County Legislative Delegation shall be composed of all senators and representatives in the General Assembly whose districts are wholly or partially in Fulton County and is showing that that is being deleted. So. Commissioner Hall, if I may, I can speak to that. Thank you um, so much. There, that language was pulled by uh, our clerk to the commission from the place where it should be, from our ordinance. And the language was correctly taken from our ordinance to include reference to the legislative delegation. However, um, unbeknownst to our clerk, uh, our General Assembly passed a revision to the, the code section that that is based on, the, um, the law that that's based on and it deleted the reference to the legislative de delegation such that it just reads that the, the Fulton County uh, Board of Commissioners um, shall select that person in subsection three. So we alerted, um, uh, we alerted the clerk to um, update the language so that it would match the law and we will be working with her to update our Fulton County code to match uh, what the current state of the law is. We'll also be working with her office to review um, all of the board appointment uh, ordinances to make sure that they are up to date with the current laws. Thank you so much. All right, Commissioner Thorne, you want to be heard? Uh, yes. You know, I, I got a lot of emails that the pub. You know, this is a drastic change. I I do know Patrice um, Hooker, but I I think the public should have an opportunity to vet her for this important position. I got tons of emails saying, give the public more time, give the public more time. We have no time. This is the first we've heard about this switch in the appointment. I would think it would to be fair to the public that we postpone so that the public has time to 
I can't agree with making this change on the agenda. I understand. Thank you for your comments. Commissioner Abdul Rockman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and, and, and to my colleague to the right of me, I, I, I do understand your concerns. They are valid concerns. However, given what we have and what we're up against, Patrice Perkins Hooker not only served in several capacities with the uh, State Bar of Georgia, she also served Fulton County for several years. And so even though you may not have vetted her, the community has vetted her. And so I would say to please, I would say please trust the community, please trust our chair, and please trust that the process is democratic all the way across the board, and it does work. All right, Commissioner, let's, this item is on the agenda. We have plenty of time to talk about Thank the pros and cons. Thank you, Chairman. All right, continue, Madam Clerk. And the vote is open. This is on the adopting the agenda. And motion passes, four yeas, one nay. Next item. 23-0334, ratification of minutes, recess meeting minutes, April 19th, regular meeting post agenda minutes, May 3rd, 2023. All right, motion, is there a motion? Motion to approve by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. The vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 23-0335, presentation of proclamations and certificates. The first proclamation is recognizing Public Works Week, sponsored by Vice Chair Ellis. All right, it is 10-12. We have 30 minutes for proclamations. 10, actually, 10-13. Yeah. And for those who are receiving proclamations uh, and your acceptance, remarks. Given the number that we have, if you would keep your uh, exceptional speeches to one minute, it would be greatly appreciated. All right. I know our public works, works folks are definitely efficient, so we're going to be efficient in getting through their proclamation as well. Um, but as we're walking down here, I do want to say a big thank you to all of them who step up at all times, all hours, 24-7 availability and for the work, for the dirty work that you do um, for all of our citizens. So with that, while you all get situated, I'll start, I'll start the proclamation. Whereas National Public Works Week is a week-long reminder of the many ways the Fulton County Department of Public Works provides the basic foundation of our day-to-day -day comfort, including roadways, traffic control, sidewalks, airport water, sanitary sewer, and stormwater management. And whereas this year's theme, Connecting the World Through Public Works, recognizes that there would be no community without the quality of life Public Works provides, and spotlights, spotlights of responsiveness and key role all employees play in the planning, building, and maintenance of infrastructure projects and services collectively known as Public Works. And whereas Fulton County's Department of Public Works maintains sanitary sewer and water distribution systems, provides stormwater management services, provides water and pollution prevention education to residents, businesses, schools, and communities, maintains road, roads and traffic signals, and performs the maintenance of all access roads, runways, ramps, hangars, and parking lots at the Fulton County Airport Brownfield facility. And whereas Public Works provides critical response capabilities, experience, and support for a 24-hour day, 365 days a year, and is committed to delivering great services to our community. And whereas the Department of Public Works is considered one of the most premier, premier agencies in the state of Georgia, and have dedicated staff and facilities that are consistently award-winning. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the full Board of Commissioners of Fulton County recognizes and commends the Department of Public Works for their continued dedication and public service to the Fulton County citizens and does hereby proclaim the week of May 21st to 27, 2023 as Public Works Week in Fulton County, Georgia. Thank you, commissioners. My name is David Clark. I'm the director of public works for Fulton County here. 
And I'm certainly very, very honored to be working alongside so many dedicated individuals uh, that we have in public works. We always say that if we do our job properly, you don't even know that we exist. And we certainly try to do that on a day in and day out basis with the infrastructure that we are charged in maintaining and ensuring that it delivers what it's supposed to to the public. So if on behalf of Public Works, I appreciate the, the proclamation and the recognition for Public Works Week next week, but we always know that every day is Public Works Day and week for what, what we do. Thank you. The next proclamation is recognizing Fulton County Certified Public Managers Appreciation Day, sponsored by Commissioner Hall. Come on down, CPM. Oh gosh, CPM times two? <laughs> he said you had a freeloader. <laughs> Is that everyone? All right. Well, you know, this is, um, this is a certification program that is near and dear to my heart because our Chief Human Resources Officer, Kenneth Herman, and our County Manager, Dick Anderson, got together and figured out a way to provide the Certified Public Managers certification in Fulton County. And I was actually one of the employees coming out of the late Fulton County Commissioner Joan P. Garner's office. I was her chief of staff at the time. And we discussed it and she said, you must do this. Um, being my chief of staff, you know, and being a part of this program will speak volumes. Well, I had no idea at that time what it would actually do because while I was in the CPM class, my late boss passed away from cancer. And um, Kenneth worked with me and he said, you're still going to graduate. We're still going to have you in this program. And on the other side of that, I became commissioner. I ran for my late boss's seat and won in the special election in 2017 and became the first Fulton County Commissioner with the Certified Public Manager's Certification. So I love this program. I will always support this program. And uh, I see we have a, a, a little CPM on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is an honor to present you with this proclamation. And the proclamation reads, whereas Fulton County government entered into a memorandum of agreement with the University of Georgia, Carl Vincent Institute of Government 
to offer the Certified Public Manager Program to managers and supervisors within Fulton County. And whereas the University of Georgia is the only organization within the state of Georgia authorized by the National CPM Consortium to offer the CPM program and Fulton County's CPM class of 2023 is the seventh class in Fulton County to receive the CPM certification. And whereas the CPM class cohort, co cohort M with an unwavering commitment to the well-being of most vulnerable children among us in partnership with Jambos, a 501c3 organization based in Atlanta, Georgia, embarked on a mission to provide pajamas to foster children and donated approximately 400 pairs of pajamas, recognizing that something so simple as pajamas would make a world of difference to the children. And whereas the CPM class cohort N conducted a donation drive for the baby pantry of Atlanta, Georgia in support of their mission of ending poverty and contributing to the health and success of the children in our communities, donated over 100 various size boxes and bags of items from their wish list to serve families with newborn babies, marking this as the largest donation drive ever seen for the baby pantry. And whereas the CPM class has completed 300 hours of coursework in nine months, dedicating three full consecutive days per month to attending classes, completing out-of-class homework and academic studies, and giving back to the community of their time, talents, and intellectual capital. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fulton County Board of Commissioners congratulates the CPM class of 2023 for successfully completing the requirements to receive their professional certifications as certified public managers and does hereby proclaim Wednesday, May 17th, 2023 as Fulton County Certified Public Managers in Fulton County, Georgia. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth L. Herman, Jr., and um, uh, could you imagine if I didn't help commis well, Commissioner Hall graduate from the CPM program, where we would have been today, and how much trouble would I have been in? That's why you always do good favors, even though you don't know what the future might hold. Um, but I, I just want to say, you know, congratulations to the graduates of, of this cohort. Uh, this is a seventh graduating class. You know, we're up to about 340 graduates of right now that have gone through the program. Uh, and, and one of the good statistics that we have from this program is outside of what we've been able to do in the community is that this, this graduating class and of the 340 individuals that have gone through the program, we still have a 90% retention rate to keeping those individuals as employees. Um, so that's a great accomplishment. But again, it, it while we've accomplished that, it, it couldn't be done without the, the participation of the Board of Commissioners for making sure that we have the resources to continue the program, the department heads uh, for allowing the employees to be gone for three days a week, of course, the leadership within Fulton County to buy into the, the idea of, of you know, developing our employees for the next phase of their potential careers, and more importantly, our partnership with UGA. I mean, we, we pushed the, um, the UGA team, Walt and Marcy, as far as they could pot potentially be pushed. But I think they've done a great job in meeting our expectations. And then, of course, for me uh, specifically, uh, the HR team and the employee development in coordinating uh, this program. And we'll hear a few words from the two presidents, and I'd like to invite uh, the one who is the president of my day today of in HR, uh, Telka Christian, who, who is my executive assistant. Good morning, everyone. I am very pleased to represent 23 of the most amazing professionals uh, in cohort M of the CPM program. Um, it is with great honor, immense gratitude, that I stand before you today to represent these amazing folks uh, and to express our deepest appreciation for the great recognition bestowed upon the entire newest class. Uh, thank you to the Board of Commissioners, your thoughtful presentation of this proclamation highlights the tireless efforts and unwavering commitment we have to, we have dedicated to public service. Um, the coursework was tiresome. 
being, you know, being made to balance your, your work at Fulton County and the coursework was uh, something that I never thought that I could get through honestly. Um, but we want to thank, of course, my boss, Kenneth Herman, um, County Manager Dick Anderson, and uh, the Board of Commissioners for believing in us, uh, pushing us, approving this program, and uh, investing in uh, the employees of Fulton County. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, commissioners. I'm Lamisa Foster Laney. I'm the chief deputy clerk of records management for Fulton County Clerk of Superior Magistrate Courts. And I have the honor of representing cohort N. <laughs> we started as strangers that all work for Fulton County. As we began working service projects and identifying our leadership style, we became friends. Now that almost a year has passed by, we discovered that we have a network that resembles a family. The instructors were knowledgeable and passionate about their subjects, and their enthusiasm was contagious. CPM has provided opportunities for personal growth and development. We discovered that there are different types of leadership skills that we were not aware of, and in that discovery, we learned about ourselves and ways to become a better leader. We want to thank Fulton County government, commissioners, our elected officials, and our department heads for allowing us to have this amazing opportunity. Thank you. How many more you got? Four more. All right. All right. All right. All right, commissioners, commissioners, we got five more proclamations. We got 17 minutes left. The next proclamation is recognizing Deputy Clarence Houston Appreciation Day, sponsored by Commissioner Hall. All right, next proclamation. Um, oh, goodness. Do they, do they need to scoot in? Oh, um, might have to do two rows. Okay, guys, get close like you know each other. No, we need you on both sides, though. Yes, come on in a little closer, closer. If you watch them, they'll tell you who needs to move in more. Look up the middle of the stairs. They'll tell you who needs to move in a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Ladies, come to the front. 
All right. Do, do we have it? Great. All right. Well, Clarence Houston, you showed tremendous courage and determination in the face of danger. And that is truly a testimony to the type of employees that are in the Sheriff's Department. And we wanted to honor you today with this proclamation. So it's my honor to present this to you. And it reads, whereas on September 5th, 2022, Fulton County Sheriff's Deputy Clarence Houston was violently attacked by an inmate at the Fulton County Jail and sustained a serious neck injury while carrying out his duties. And whereas Deputy Houston showed incredible courage and determination in the face of danger, and despite being seriously injured, continued to provide assistance to his fellow officers, and whereas Deputy Houston's dedication to his duties and colleagues serves as a model for all members of law enforcement and for the community at large, and whereas Deputy Houston's selflessness and commitment to service are a testament to the values of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office and the law enforcement profession, and whereas all citizens of Fulton County are called upon to join us in honoring and thanking Deputy Houston for his service and in supporting the men and women of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office who put themselves in harm's way every day to keep our community safe and secure. Now therefore be it resolved that the Fulton County Board of Commissioners recognizes Deputy Clarence Houston for his outstanding service, bravery, and heroism, and extend our sincere gratitude and heartfelt appreciation for his selfless sacrifice and unwavering commitment to duty, and does hereby proclaim Wednesday, May 17th, 2023, as Deputy Clarence Houston Appreciation Day in Fulton County, Georgia. Congratulations and thank you so much. For you long, but I just want to take this time out to thank the sheriff, uh, all of my Fulton County family for all your thoughts, your prayers, your texts, your phone calls. Um, it's been a long road, but here we are. I really appreciate the recognition. Thank you so much. So I know how humble uh, Houston is. I want you all to understand the magnitude. First, let me start in good and proper order and thank Commissioner Hall and, and all of our commissioners and our graduate tour to move toward Commissioner Khadijah because on yesterday, we celebrated those that have fallen in the line of duty. So we had eight individuals and we were right in the atrium where we had one or two family members join us. But this is the difficult portion of what we do. When we put on a uniform, put on a badge, and go towards danger. And in this circumstance, and, and Clarence Houston is being extremely humble, his carotid artery was missed by inches. Or he'd have been on that board yesterday. But for the grace of God. Amen. So with Amen. that, I, I want to tell all of our commissioners, thank you. Thank you for the continued support. And thank you for your bravery. Thank you for... Uh, being part of this team, because that's what makes Fulton County Sheriff's Office as special as it is. Thank you all.
The next proclamation is recognizing Center for Excellence Capstone Student Appreciation Day, sponsored by Commissioner Hall. Fulton County IT, do it. Capstone, come on down. Good to see you. Good morning. You have anyone else from Capstone here? From IT? Chad, Amacio, anybody? <laughs> Chad's working. IT? Oh, they're working, okay, well, um, this is an outstanding program um, that helps us to feed into our graduates and undergraduate students, and it has been a great success, so it is, in, and I've always supported it and uh, attended the, grad, the uh, ceremony where you kind of graduate them out of the program, and so it is an honor to present this proclamation Whereas Fulton County Information Technology Department has prioritized the availability of talent to sustain delivery of IT services, and whereas the Fulton County IT Department has made recruitment of local talent a component of fulfilling the mission of providing excellence in IT delivery, and whereas in 2018, FCIT established the Center of Excellence Internship and Capstone Program to support Fulton County and give graduate and undergraduate students at Georgia State University, Kennesaw State University, Atlanta Technical College, and Georgia Institute of Technology an opportunity to gain hands-on experience with Fulton County's IT department and various Fulton County departments, acquire new skills, earn a semester grade and receive job offers prior to graduation. And whereas since the inception of the Center of Excellence Capstone Program, it has grown and has approximately 300 Capstone students completing over 150 countywide projects for a savings of an estimated $1 million to date. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners of Fulton County congratulates the interns from the Center of Excellence Capstone Student Program for successfully completing the requirements of the Fulton County Information Technology Enterprise Project Management Office Center of Excellence Capstone Program and does hereby proclaim Wednesday, May 17th, 2023 as Center of Excellence Capstone Student Appreciation Day in Fulton County, Georgia. Congratulations to you and your team and the students who have graduated through this program. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Kerrigan, CIO here at Fulton County. Uh, it's an honor to receive this proclamation for our team. We'd like to thank Pamela uh, Threets, who has driven the program this semester. A uh, very large cohort that graduated. We've graduated over 300 students from this program. And I'm just happy to carry uh, the battalion forward and keep it going, expand it. It really is a pipeline to feed young talent into government, to expose them to the opportunities that exist to serve our citizens and give back to the community. And it's, I'm humbled to be a part of this program. Thank you. The next proclamation is recognizing Public Safety Memorial Day, sponsored by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. Can I get all of law enforcement to the stage? Well, to the front, please. I guess in some ideals it would be stages. <laughs> but can I get all law enforcement, please? All law enforcement. And Sheriff. Chief, I see you come.
And if we have any operational law enforcement, I don't mean just the ones in the badge, but if we have any operational in the room, I want you up here as well. I know. The meat is running. <laughs> this proclamation states, whereas public safety personnel dedicate their careers and their very lives to maintaining the safety of the communities they serve, with some paying the ultimate sacrifice, and we all know that true freedom is never truly free. Whereas Fulton County citizens are protected by hundreds of dedicated men and women, including those serving the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, Marshal's Office, Police Department, and Fire Rescue Departments. And whereas Fulton County public safety personnel who have paid the ultimate sacrifice in service to citizens include Sheriff's Deputies Thomas W. Camp, J.E. Jenkins, Ricky Leon Kitchen, Henry Eugene Privet, Hort Keith Teasley, Robert Willard Watson, Ada J. Webb, Verna J. Yarborough, Deputy Marshal David Larry Foles, Police Officers Aaron Javon Blunt, David Leslie Hagens, James Marion Carroll, Christopher Biker May, Terrence Avery Green, Deputy Marshal, excuse me, and Firefighters Harold Gregory Hoot Gibson, Michael Gurley, uh, Felix Roberts, and Jimmy C. Walker. And whereas Fulton County pays tribute to its falling public safety personnel and their families every day through a permanent memorial at Wolf Creek and a virtual tribute through the Fulton County Fallen Heroes Facebook page, and whereas May 15th, is observed nationally as National Peace Officers Memorial Day, a day to pay tribute to public safety personnel and their families for the service to the communities they serve. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners of Fulton County pledges to never forget the sacrifices of public safety personnel who have paid the ultimate sacrifice on behalf of Fulton County citizens and will continue to say their names in remembrance of their ultimate sacrifice and does hereby proclaim Monday, May 15, 2023 as Public Safety Memorial Day in Fulton County, Georgia. Would you please put your hands together for those that serve? I'll turn it over to you, Cheryl. Chief, you better do what I said. You better come on over here. I know you're taller than me. Oh, I didn't realize I was speaking this morning, but um, this is uh, a very important thing to, to realize that these officers that are, are beside me come into work every day and have no idea what's going to happen, have no idea if they're going to make it home. And um, we've all worked the streets before and, and remember feeling that and being on calls where you weren't sure that you were going home to see your wife or to see your children or your husband or whatever. And that's a huge sacrifice and it's a huge toll on these folks every single day. So please put your hands together and thank them that they... Thank you. Thank them for the courage that they have every day to come to work. Thank you very much. Well, I didn't know I was going to speak either. But listen, uh, I think Chief encapsulated uh, the meaning and the heart behind what happens when you put this uniform on. And a lot of times we forget about the families. We forget that there are loved ones at home, kids at home that are waiting on their garage door to go up waiting on that front door to open, waiting on that ring chime to go off, 
to see mommy and daddy come in. So these heroes and sheroes that work every day tirelessly to make sure that they provide the services, again, running towards danger when most of us uh, run the opposite direction. So again, thank you, Commissioner Khadija, uh, for always uh, having our spine, not just our back, and uh, Commissioner Hall and the rest of the commissioners uh, who understand the value of what this looks like. So again, thank you to them, right? Chief and I have the easy job at this point, right? Not after 30 years, but we have the easy job because they don the badge, badges, they don the uniforms, and they go towards trouble. So thank you all. Thank you for serving. The next proclamation is recognizing Bendership Inc. Appreciation Day, sponsored by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. Dr. Nazira Daywood, is she here? This proclamation is not only to uh, recognize Dr. Nazira Daywood, but also to let the community know that we support inclusivity and diversity in Fulton County. This proclamation, whereas after a rewarding career as a medical doctor, Dr. Nazira Daywood has founded and manages along with a team of passionate minority women the company Vendorship Incorporated. And whereas Vendorship Incorporated is in its sixth year of operation and is headquartered in Fulton County with a mission to help level the playing field in the government contracting process and provide more equitable access to help identify and secure contracts for marginalized businesses. And whereas the Vendorship philosophy has little to do with business and individual contractor profit as much as it does with service and advancing the capacity of communities and constituencies. The team is motivated to help governments solve problems and innovate quality of life enhancements in the delivery of public services. And whereas Vendorship Inc. is a full service government contracting partner and they all work with companies larger and small, new and well-established, to build and condense capacity to get the attention of governments and build contractual relationships with governments over time to solve problems and even raise more interest in specific lanes of social and structural innovation and whereas Vendorship's core values are diligence, dependability, and determination. And with a strong vision and confidence in their clients, they all believe that anyone can reach imagined heights. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fulton County Board of Commissioners recognizes Vendorship, Inc. for their innovative and groundbreaking work and does hereby proclaim Wednesday, May 17th, 2023 as Vendorship 
Incorporated Appreciation Day in Fulton County, Georgia. Can you please put your hands together? Thank you. Our heartfelt appreciation goes to the commissioners of Fulton County and their management team for their invaluable support. I want to thank and extend a special note of gratitude to Commissioner Khatija Abdul Rahman for her outstanding leadership and encouraging small businesses, including ours. My tenure at the Fulton County Health Department and the chairman of the Board of Commissioners office was nothing short of excellence. During my time here, I had the honor of collaborating with many brilliant individuals who shared a deep passion for positivity, impacting the lives of those we served. Undoubtedly, every job presents its obstacles. However, I can confidently attest that the county administration furnished me, furnished me with the necessary resources to triumph over these challenges. As we saw today, I also graduated a few years ago from the Fulton County Supervisory Manager Development Program which proved to be instrumental in refining my professional aptitude and expertise. Through this program, I gained invaluable insights and hands-on experience that honed my skills, enabling me to become a more effective and a proficient member of the workforce. As I parted my ways with Fulton County Employment in August of 2017, I was uncertain about my future. I began my journey from the comfort of my couch, unsure about my next steps, and without a steady income. Yet despite the doubts and uncertainties that loomed over me, my father's words of encouragement always resonated. Any work that we take with commitment and clear focus will yield new, new ways of thinking and seeing for others, thus create history. Success awaits those who are not afraid to fail, try, who are not afraid to try and possibly fail. Yet, uh, though sheer, through sheer determination and resilience, Vendorship was established in January of 2018. Vendorship's mission is to facilitate high-quality private partnerships between county, state, city, and federal government. Fast forward five years. We are thrilled to report that Vendorship has a global presence and has extended, expanded to a $5 million revenue sales revenue business. We have assisted small to mid-sized businesses acquire more than $30 million government contracts. In, and help them with their revenue stream. Our team is a diverse group of individuals and professionals who are very committed and have an, an unwavering commitment to exceptional services. Quickly, thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Moni. Thank you, Madhu Chatterjee. Thank you, Arunima. Thank you, Daryl, for being a part of our team. And thank you, Madhu Parikh, and those who could not be here as well with us. Across the nation, procurement officials are repeatedly voicing their desire for more diverse and qualified small businesses and innovators to submit quality contracts and vendor proposals. At Vendorship Inc., we understand the importance of this sentiment. And we take great care in assisting businesses with the qualification to support governments in delivering the highest possible quality of life for their constituents. As we express our gratitude for this recognition, we urge officials who are within the sound of our voice to reach out to us and learn more about how our team can support them in achieving their goals. Thank you again, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioners. The last proclamation is recognizing Olga Shumate Appreciation Day, sponsored by Commissioner Abdul Rahman. <laughs> Come on, Olga. <laughs> Come on, those that support. Now, has, has everyone, is, is it everybody who's a part of Fulton Fresh and the Extension Office down here? Okay, we want to make sure everybody's here. 
Thank you. Now, how does one firecracker celebrate another firecracker? <laughs> this proclamation, whereas Olga Shume is an expanded food and nutrition education program assistant with the University of Georgia and Fulton County Expansion, and whereas Olga has dedicated 15 years of service to the University of Georgia and 13 years of service to Fulton County Extension, and whereas Olga has enhanced the lives of Fulton County citizens by providing nutrition, education, and participating in numerous outreach events like the Fulton Fresh Mobile Market and formal educational programs. And whereas Olga has been recognized for her outstanding work with many certifications and commendations, including the Pre-Service Award Certificate of Achievement, Serve Safe Food Handler Test Training Certificate for the most graduates for the expanded food and nutrition sessions in 2020, and she has been recognized annually for having the highest number of graduates in Georgia for the EFNEP program. And whereas Olga was instrumental in the first Fulton Fresh Kids Camp at Camp Truett in 2022, and has introduced her famous harvest muffins to different activities around the county alongside her favorite commissioner, Khadija. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble with that one. But seriously though, Olga has served Fulton County. She has served the citizens. Many a nights, Olga will put up a batch of two to 300 um, muffins that she makes to give out to the community. And so it, was, it is with great pride that now therefore be resolved that the Fulton County Board of Commissioners and all those associated with the Fulton County Extension congratulates Olga Shoemate on her retirement, not, well, we'll talk about that later, <laughs> and recognizes her impact on the communities of Fulton County and for her dedicated years of service and does hereby proclaim Wednesday, May 17th, 2023 as Olga Shoemate Appreciation Day in Fulton County. Can you please put your hands together for this wonderful, wonderful person? Nice. <laughs> like she said, from a firecracker to another firecracker. I'm supposed to, I do have to respect her since she, I'm at the commissioners. I do appreciate it. And I didn't know I was getting it until a couple of months ago. And she did surprise me. And yes, I will be making muffins for next month. <laughs> I already heard about it. So, but it's been a pleasure, even as. Another county, I am a Rockdale County, <laughs> Rockdale County citizen, and I serve more pride to be serving Fulton County. And especially as my last day of extension is tomorrow, I will miss them and everything, but I appreciate everything for the commissioners and commissioners for this appreciation day. Thank you. All right, commissioners, it's right at 11 o'clock. Yes. Okay. You ready? Yes. You ready now? Okay. Okay. 
that you know two All right, Madam Clerk. So we have two items that we need to. One is the annual TAN tax an anticipation note. That's time sensitive. So without objection, we'd like to take that now. Uh, Madam CFO, you ready? This is a TAN tax anticipation note. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This morning, the finance department received the um, bids for our annual tax anticipation note. Um, the lowest bid received was from J.P. Morgan Securities, LLC, um, at an interest rate of 3.195244. Hakeem is passing out the, the resolution with all of the um, blanks filled in, so at this time. Sound it. On page 7, 230340, Finance. Request approval to accept the bid of $200 million tax anticipation notes for the 2023 approval of a resolution which authorizes issuance and sale of the $200 million general fund tax and anticipation notes for Fulton County, Georgia. Our motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Ellis. Commissioner Ellis, you have the floor. Vice Chair Ellis. Yeah, just, just a point of reference so we have it. What's the, what, was, what did we, what was the rate last year? One point zero four zero. One point zero four zero. Yes, and then the, so this is um, so the rate of five, but then the, but the net is you said three point. What's the number now? Three, three point. point it, it rounds to three point one nine five. Three point one nine five. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Motion on the floor is to approve. Cast your vote, please. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. All right, next item, well, before we get to the next item, on page 11, uh, item number 23-0356, this is the Board of Registration and Elections issue. I'm told that there are a number of people who may want to to address this, and it's at the end of the agenda, so if there are no objections, we'll move that up and take that, uh, that uh, next. And before we be get any objections to moving that up? No. All right. Before we get to that issue, I want to read this into the public record. This is an email that I received uh, right before the meeting today. Rob, this is dated uh, May 16, 2023. Rob, I have been reflecting on the controversy surrounding your nomination of me for the soon to be vacant chair of the Board of Registration and Elections, BRE. You know that I have always tried to avoid the hyper-partisanship that has been so destructive in our country and state. I thought that the kind of non-partisanship I would bring to the BRE would be productive. However, I understand the belief of so many of my Democratic friends that a Democratic county ought to have a Democratic majority on this BRE. Come on, come on. Otherwise, the optics, as they say, aren't good. It is clear that my nomination has become divisive and that my service would continue to be divisive, which is the last thing I want for our county. Thus, I am requesting that you withdraw my nomination. Your support and belief in me means the world to me personally and professionally. I will continue to be honored by your confidence and that of my former colleagues who believe I would serve in that role fairly and in a nonpartisan way. May God continue to bless your work and Fulton County. Lee. Uh, 
Uh, I, are you saying you want to move this item before public comment? Is that what you're suggesting from the agenda perspective? We can move it up as last. We can do it after public comment. I would, yeah, I think the public should be given the opportunity to that's speak. That's what I so. said. Okay, that's fine. Just wanted to confirm. Madam Clerk. On page six, public hearing. 230336, public comment. Citizens wishing to participate in public comment will be allowed to appear in person or may choose to participate virtually via Zoom video conferencing or by submitting their comments in writing online by registering on the county website, www.fultoncountyga.gov. Priority for public comment will be given to Fulton County citizens and those individuals representing businesses or organizations located within Fulton County. Speakers will be granted up to two minutes each. The public will not be allowed to yield or donate time to other speakers. The public comment portion of the meeting will not exceed 30 minutes. In the event the 30 minute time limit is reached prior to public comments being completed, public comment will be suspended and the business portion of the BOC meeting will commence. Public comment will resume at the end of the meeting. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, we will start with speakers here in Assembly Hall. We have received 66 speaker cards. Okay. First five speakers, please come down. Representative Shira Draper, Council Member Antonia Lewis, Patty Nathan, Trisha Gephardt, and Daniel Jackman. All right, now, speakers, as always, when you have 15 seconds remaining in your two minutes, I'll simply say 15 seconds, that's your clue to conclude your remarks. Also, if someone has made the point that you want to make, uh, don't feel that it's necessary to re keep repeating the same thing. So we'd appreciate it. And we have 30 minutes for public comment. If you do the math, 60 times two, that's two hours. We have 30 minutes, so we really appreciate your understanding. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you to the commissioners. I'm Representative Syrah Draper from House District 90 in DeKalb County, but I'm gonna be waiving my time. Thank you. Next. Good morning, I'm Patty Nathan. I'm a Fulton County resident and have lived in Sandy Springs for almost 40 years. I attended monthly BRE meetings in person for two years before the pandemic, then virtually since March 2020. During that time, I observed firsthand each chair of the board advocate for fair and free elections. They consistently work to make voting equally accessible from the northern part of the county to the southern part of the county. I've also witnessed challenges to voter rolls that were particularly frivolous, mostly coming from Republicans. We have seen voter suppression at the federal level and the state level all coming from Republicans. We need a chair who will buck the trend established by the Republicans. We need a person who will embrace free, fair and free elections. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, for taking the safe and secure route and appointing Patrice Hooker Perkins to lead the Board of Registrations and Elections. Thank you. Come on, let's go. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Trisha Gephardt, and I live in District 3. I voted against Lee Morris, and so I appreciate the fact that he has withdrawn his um, appointment nomination to this board. Um, I do wonder why, Chairman Pitts, you did even bring his name forward, so I'm curious about that. Um, as he said, we should be represented by a Democratic representative in our county. And so I'm just wondering if, you know, why we, a lot of people are here today because we believe in that. And so I'm curious as to why we even got to this point. I do support Patrice um, Perkins Hooker for this role and I'm glad that she's stepping up. I appreciate her commitment to diversity over her career. I appreciate that she was president of the state bar in 2015 for Georgia and that she has done um, wonderful service for our state. Um, I am grateful that Lee Morris has withdrawn. I'm in support of Patrice Hooker. 
but I really think that we need to make sure that democracy doesn't die in the darkness. All these people are here today to make sure that doesn't happen, and we need to keep monitoring this board. Thank you. Next five speakers, please come down. Ian Hansen, Lauren Waits, Laura Gimbrist, Corin Munson, and David Thrash. Just because you've signed up, if, if what you were going to say has already been stated, in the interest of time, we'd appreciate it. Yes, sir, you have the floor. Uh, good morning. My name is Daniel Jackman, and I am a resident of Fulton County in Commission District 4. Hello, Commissioner Hall. Um, thank you for your good work. Um, I want to thank the Board of Commissions, uh, Chairman Pitts, especially for your previous and ongoing support of elections in Fulton County. And I ask that the Commission vote to appoint um, Patrice Perkins Hooker as chair of the Board of Elections. Um, the Board of Elections, the BRE, is the body responsible for ensuring continued success of elections in the county. They make crucial decisions regarding uh, election administration. For example, the Fulton County Board of Registration and Elections approved early voting schedule that makes voting available for seven days a week with hours on most days from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. This was and is necessary for my family and my neighbors to cast their vote. The 2024 election year will be a significant year in Georgia and especially here in Fulton County. So we need a board chair that is someone who is an inclusive, forward-thinking leader like Ms. Perkins Hooker, a chair who is supportive of our election workers, someone willing to take a stand to maintain and expand access for voting. So again, I just wanna ask the commission to vote to appoint Patrice Perkins Hooker as chair. Thank you so much. Come on, ma'am, let's go. Good morning, my name is Lauren Waits. I'm a resident of Morningside, uh, proud District 3. I appreciate and I'm here to endorse the nomination of Patrice Perkins Hooker. However, I really want to express my concern about the disarray among the majority party on the Board of Commissioners. I don't understand why it took all these people coming out to have to convey to you the values that we hold dear for inclusiveness, for asserting that voters should have access to the polls, access to ballot boxes, and a candidate who twice voted in support of limiting access to the vote was never acceptable in the first place. Um, I, I, we will continue. We have given, I've given over 500 hours um, watching Board of Registration and Elections meetings, recruiting Democrats to serve on the panel. But I really want to underscore um, that this is actually not about party. I would not be for an ardent partisan candidate. I believe in Patrice Perkins Hooker because she has the demonstrated experience. Um, but the fact that this ever was a question and the fact that the previous, can previous candidates' comments had to waste time um, this morning calls attention to the wrong things. We need to be talking about how to make sure that every voter, Republican, Democrat, independent, has full and equal access to the ballot. So I thank you for your attention to that matter and hope we can continue to underscore those values going forward. Thank you so much. Next, next five speakers, Christy Lynn, Sally Dorn, Ruth Wall, Jane Zolik, and Aline Nakamura. Good morning, I'm Laurie Demarest. I'm a Fulton County resident. Uh, I uh, volunteer on a voter protection hotline I have for the last couple of years. I've also been attending the Board of Elections meetings. So I've seen both from the calls to the hotline and from the numerous voter challenges at the, at the Board of Elections, what the uh, state legislature has done to voters in Georgia and has, has been restricting voter access. Um, I'm appreciative of the fact, uh, Commissioner Chair Pitts, that uh, you have listened, obviously, to the, to the voices of the people that have come in over the last several days expressing their concern and that you have withdrawn the nomination and nominated Patrice Perkins Hooker, who I fully support. I think she's terrific, and I'm very happy with that. Um, but I am concerned, as other people are, that um, given the what feels like a tax on the Fulton County Board of Elections and Fulton County voter access that we've had to be defending against that have come from outside, that it feels like 
an attack was coming from within here. So um, that, that's just how it feels as a voter and a resident of Fulton County. I just wanted you to appreciate that. Thank you for changing your mind and listening to the people. Hello, my name is uh, Corwin Munson. Um, I live at 930 Howell Mill Road. I guess it's the Upper West Side they call it these days, but me being a greater baby, I still call it Blantown and West Side, okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen, today I stand before you. I was coming to start, talk to you guys about this is a Republican takeover, but I, I see you came to your senses. But we have something else to talk about today. We're going to talk about the elephant in the room, OK? Today, I stand before you to share something that has deeply affected me over the last five years. As some of you are aware, I have been a vocal critic of certain politicians and their policies. And because of this, I have been targeted, harassed by these individuals through frivolous stalking charges. Let me tell you, it's not pleasant feeling to be accused of something you did not do. Being stalked is a serious issue that can cause immense mental and emotional trauma to the victim. But what's even worse is the accusation. It's when the accusation is baseless just to play, a, to, just to, play to silence someone who dares to speak out against the powers to be. I am deeply saddened by the fact that some politicians have stopped, stooped to such levels just to silence their critics. Such abuse of power is a violation of our rights as citizens. And it's an attack on our freedom of speech. 15 seconds. I want to make it clear that I have never stalked anyone, let alone those in positions of power. But what I have did is sent to the Department of Justice evidence of collusion, conspiracy, bank fraud. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Next speaker. Thank you, sir. Sir, 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 sir. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker. I'll keep it quick. I support Patrice. Um, I was adamantly opposed to Morris and the way this whole thing went down. Um, but thank you, and thank you to Natalie Hall, who would have voted against it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ruth Wall of Inman Park, and I've been knowing Rob Pitts for over 40 years. He's always done the right thing for us, and we are so glad you are doing the right thing today. Thank you very much. Next five speakers, Saya Abney, Rome Harrison, John Evans, Kevin Baldowney, and Matt Ruinzak. Hi, I'm Jane Zellick, a resident of Fulton County. I want to thank you for putting forth the nomination for Patrice Perkins Hooker. And I, I support that nomination and thank all who helped to influence the change in this matter. As you know, Republicans across the country in Georgia and in Fulton County have been um, consistently strategizing and working to reduce voter access. Now they're apparently taking aim at the functionality of our election departments. Despite numerous court cases failing to prove appreciable malfeasance in Georgia or in Fulton County, well-coordinated election deniers have been frequent public commenters at our Board of Elections and Board of Commissioner meetings, repeating the same tired false narrative. Some of them have added significant work for election staff by submitting numerous challenges to registered voters. Many of those challenges show a notable lack of understanding of the federal election law and of the state mandated election process and its checks and balances. But they do fulfill a goal of taking up staff time and adding expense to elections. I deeply appreciate the nomination of a woman with deep legal experience and a proven track record of unbiased work on behalf of the citizens of Fulton County and the county itself. Um, thank you for supporting enhancing voting rights and access. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Eileen Nakamura, and I'm from Sandy Springs. 
While I am thrilled that Chairman Pitts has replaced Lee Morris's nomination with Patrice Hooker's, I am greatly opposed to the secretive and rushed fashion in which this nomination process is occurring. The reason that I am speaking up against the nomination of a Republican to the chair of the BRE in Fulton is that with 2024 looming, it is more urgent than ever to maintain Fulton BRE's Democratic majority because it is clear that Democrats must act collectively to ensure the security of Georgia's elections in 2024. I'd like to remind this board that in January 2021, all of Georgia's election software was stolen from Coffee County. While our Republican Secretary of State, our majority Republican State Election Board, and the Republican-controlled General Assembly has looked the other way, voting system experts have called this the single worst election system breach in our country's history. Worse still, Georgia's election software for all 159 counties has now been out in the wild for over two years and has been copied by known election deniers and countless others, making future Georgia elections easy to hack without detection. This breach only came to light due to litigation by the Coalition for Good Governance against the Secretary of State's office. In a hearing earlier this month, the Secretary's office admitted to the court that despite being aware of the statewide breach and despite knowing the Department of Homeland Security has verified and warned that Georgia's voting systems have dangerous vulnerabilities which must be mitigated, the Secretary of State's office 15 seconds. has no plans to make any mitigations, even partially, until 2025. We cannot trust the Republican SOS, the Republican State Election Board, or the Republican General Assembly to ensure secure elections in Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Saya Abney, and I am a Fulton voter from Sandy Springs. I was here to oppose the nomination of Lee Morris as the chair of Fulton's BRE. Um, but even so, I still have some things to say. Fulton's BRE is a critical board. Fulton County has over 860,000 registered voters, which is more than 11 states. Fulton's elections will always be complex and expensive. Our Republican Secretary of State and State Elections Board have no plans to make any mitigations to our compromised election system until 2025, despite the fact that they know of those compromises. Before last year's midterms, 13 cybersecurity and election experts warned both the State Election Board and the Secretary of State that Georgia's election software breach posed serious threats to our elections. But they stated this can easily be mitigated by switching to Georgia's established emergency handmarked paper ballot voting procedures, which is something a Board of Election can choose to do. The BRE chair is a position with unprecedented importance, particularly at this time, so while I recognize and appreciate Ms. Hooker's service to the county, I would like to state my displeasure with the surprise nature of and rushed vote on this nomination. Particularly in times when controversies are so high, like now, um, it's particularly as a transgender individual, this sneaking around and quick rush processes are something that we should be above as a democratic county and that we should be working to preserve transparency and due process 15 seconds. for all of our constituents. Thank you. John Evans, Roswell, Georgia. I came to commend the uh, chairman for supporting um, Lee Morris for the uh, position of head of the BRE, but it appears it's been changed now and I want to thank uh, you for that brave move to change the, the tenor of the BRE. Um, it's, it's sad that citizens are having to do the work of the BRE to clean up the voter rolls, which is a federal law. And there's a number of them that have been, uh, have said it's, it's, it's uh, not important, but it is important. And it's uh, the thousands have been removed from the rolls and I know I've worked on uh, the number of people that have died and they're still on our rolls. I found over 400 that were not cleaning up the rolls. 
and I was hoping for a change in the way that the system is working now, but it appears that uh, there seems to be just a move in the county that we have to have Democrats in charge. Next five speakers, Michael Barron, David Cantrell, Melissa Ferrillo, Carla Barrett, and Maria Godura. All right, Kevin Muldowney, Fulton County. You know, one thing about the voter rolls, uh, the BRE just removed 48,000 on their own, of their own volition, 48,000 that were uh, on the voter rolls that shouldn't have been there. So it's not a partisan effort. It's, it's, we're not trying to screw you guys. So, uh, The chairman's position of the Fulton BRE is by its very nature a nonpartisan position. The primary role of the Board of Elections is to uphold the election code as prescribed by the legislature. It's the job of the chairperson to make sure that code is enforced and not merely interpreted by the board. Our current chair was not a real stickler for state election code. There were a number of occasions where the 10-day rule for voter challenges was conveniently ignored. Ms. Woolard was also responsible for silencing public comment at special called meetings. The same type of meeting where Richard Barron's lack of ability was brought to light, eventually leading to his dismissal. There is no room for the suppression of dissenting voices in a free society. The BRE under Ms. Woolard still has no standard operating procedure. I guess process was just not a priority for her. Ms. Barrett, your recent claim that Chairman Morris's appointment would literally put democracy at stake made no sense. Chairman Morris was known for very fair and held very moderate positions. Ms. Woolard, on the other hand, was employed by Stacey Abrams, fair fight, as a partisan lobbyist right up to the day she was appointed as chair. Uh, one of the uh, Chairman Morris's support of SB 202 was cited as, as an impediment to his appointment. The same SB 202 that was claimed to be Jim Crow 2.0. But when it was enacted, Georgia had the highest minority vote, voter participation in its history. You have 15 seconds. We need a chairman, we need a BRE chairman that puts adherence of Georgia election code as a top priority. We'll listen to all sides of a debate and make sure the election part. Good morning, Commissioners. Matt Rowenzak, uh, Fulton County resident. Um, when it comes to this appointment for the chair of the Board of Elections, I find it incredibly ironic to me that this position is supposed to be nonpartisan. Yet so many arguments being made are entirely partisan. Just as you've heard, Fulton County is a Democratic county. Therefore, we must have a Democratic chair. That is not the purpose of this role. It is supposed to be free and fair and follow the law. It's not a legislator role that is partisan, that makes law. This position is to enforce the law, the election code, and ensure that we have free, fair, and transparent elections. That shouldn't be controversial. On top of so many partisan arguments, we also have dramatic comments to rile people up. Commissioner Barrett, you were quoted in the AJC saying, quote, it literally is putting democracy at stake. Anyone that's rational sees this hyperbole and unprofessional nature of those comments. I suppose we have to remind folks again what this position actually does. And in the last, uh, the, Ms. Wooler, her term, the law has been violated numerous times. Whether you acknowledge it or not, it has. And I would request uh, Chairman Pitts, that we do have extra time because, with all due respect to Patrice Perkins seconds. Cooker, she was the attorney assigned to the Board of Elections during this time where the law was violated numerous times. And it's been mentioned before, there were last week 48,000 illegitimate registrations. Thank you.
morning, commissioners. My name is Melissa Fiorillo, and I'm also a Fulton County resident. The Board of Elections Chair is supposed to be a nonpartisan position, as stated. This position is not making law, changing law. This is supposed to be enforcing the law. Did Kathy Woolard follow the law during her tenure? This is part of her oath. Here are a few examples of how Kathy Woolard did not do her job or did not know how to do her job during her time on the BRE. Kathy had many voter challenges from citizens spending their own time to help clean up the voter rolls. Despite Georgia law requiring her to schedule a hearing within 10 days on numerous occasions, this did not happen. She also encouraged people, she also discouraged people from helping uh, the, with the voter rolls because she claimed it mired her staff with excessive work. Never mind the law. She was also part of a three board member that squashed public comment that uh, on special meetings. She changed and amended the bylaws. This is not being transparent. It's not, it's voter suppression and it's voter intimidation. Also, the big internal audit that was conducted highlighting areas needing change and improvement, it has been two years and there are still many glaring issues. For instance, we still have no standard operating procedures. Partisan politics has no place in our elections, but putting a highly partisan Democrat in office and knowing she has violated the law, you are violating your oaths by allowing her to continue. Kathy Woolard worked, as they had said, for fair fight up until the day before she took the position on the BR-80. You have received a letter from some of the Democrat House of Representatives making this position very partisan. As stated in the letter, we will continue on this issue and support the efforts to nominate and appoint another reliable expert who is a Fulton County resident. You're not a reliable candidate unless you're a Democrat. You have not uh, withdrawn, you have now withdrawn a candidate that you know. Thank you, ma'am. Next five speakers, Sandra Gale Motley Grunt, Henrietta Antonian, Jane Meadows, Michelle Torpe, Tushala Turner. Maria Gaudi, a Fulton County resident. I had testified to you several months ago that two years ago when I was following the chain of custody, I was a witness to two cycles of eight vans for a total of 16 vans that made a unsolicited pit stop. It was unscheduled on the way to the World Congress Center and those vans were filled to the brim with ballots. <laughs> yeah, well, I have film. Yeah, it's, it's funny, made. isn't it? Come on, order. You have the so, floor, ma'am. So, the other person who saw what I did had her house shot up and she moved out of state. So, you know, um, we, we've been wondering, how did that come about? How did that come about? And with all these voter challenges, most recently, 48,000 voter challenges in the last couple of months, and from the ones that Jason Frazier had found, were over 30,000. 30, that, that's accounted, you know, the dots are starting to get connected. And Kathy Woolard was was in charge that entire time. Kathy Woolard had, from the time of a voter challenge, had 10 days. She ignored her job for two years and just let it go. Now there are Democrats who are getting screwed by the cheating too. Look at DeKalb County too, not just Fulton County. So it's not just Democrat. it's not just Republicans. This is Democrats too who are getting screwed. They can't, they, they can't uh, fairly run in an election either because of this machine going on. It is important that somebody be bipartisan and do the job correctly and be honest and fair. I applaud you, Chairman 15 Pitts, seconds. for allowing a, Demo a Republican to come in and take a look, but even if it's a, a Democrat, it needs to be somebody who was not involved in these uh, illicit proceedings the last two years, and if Ms. Patrice she might do a good job in some things. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. My name is Sandra Gale Motley, formerly Grant. I am the founder of Percolate International. It is a tech company. It's registered in the state of Virginia. 
In 2017, Robert Scoble, a Silicon Valley multimillionaire, contacted me through a mediator in North Carolina. He was interested in our vision for solar energy. Proof of our concept is in the U.S. Bankruptcy Court in Atlanta, filed in 2017. I discovered who Robert Scoble was after he was accused of sexual harassment. At that time, I realized it was a pattern. My children and I became targeted for our business using students and children to harass and stalk us. This has gone on for 4,000 consecutive days. Instead of receiving the support that we need, using women to torment my breast surgery because I will not give up my business. It is a family-owned business. Douglas Jordan Grant of Decatur, Harrison Frank Grant in Route to Atlanta, Olivia Monet Grant in McDonough, Georgia, Bichelia Gar Garland, I'm sorry, in Peachtree City. We are doing incredible things. We are going to make people proud of what we seconds. have as far as our assets, but I will not relinquish them to anyone. I ask you to ask every student in the country to contact me and meet me in court. I will not give up our business. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jan Meadows, a longtime resident of Fulton County, 50 years. I even ran for commissioner for this body and got in a runoff back in 1975. I just want to commend Commissioner Pitts for taking a step to make his change his recommendation. The eyes of the nation are on Fulton County, and we all know it. And as Lee Moore said, the optics, I don't think we need to be partisan or say one, a Democrat or a Republican. Right now, this country has been seriously harmed and damaged by the polarization. And Fulton County does not need to play into it. We need to be above it. We are still in the midst of it. Fannie Willis is going through it. She, the decision hasn't even been made. So I want you to implore this body to look at the big picture. Look at the national picture when you make your decisions. And that's all I want to say, and thank you. Uh, all right, <clears throat> how many more? We've got 30 more speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the 30 minutes has expired. So what's your pleasure, commissioners? I'd like for us to allow the people to speak because they are here. I agree. Motion to, motion. Motion to extend the um, public comment so that the remaining people can speak who are here. All right. who have already signed up. It's motion to expend, spend it, let's go. It's 11.30 now, let's go to 12 o'clock. Maybe get everybody in by 12 o'clock. Is there a second? Give a second after that. All right, motion to extend the public comment time till 12 o'clock. Madam Clerk, for those in favor say aye, opposed, no, the ayes have it. Continue. Next five speakers. Again, what you were going to say, someone's already said, in the interest of time. We haven't even got to the business yet, but I would appreciate it. Parker, Next five speakers, please. Parker Short, Rashawn Kemp, Richard Rose, 
Stephanie Ali, and Niles Francis. Call them again, Madam Clerk. Parker Short, Rashawn Kemp, Richard Rose, Stephanie Ali, and Niles Francis. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Stephanie Ali. I'm the policy director at New Georgia Project Action Fund. Thank you for your time today. I, like many people, wanted to speak in opposition to Mr. Morris, but will take a moment instead to point out a couple of the fallacies that have been pointed out today, one being that boards of elections are being redrawn on partisan lines across the state, and to see Fulton County go in that direction would have been a huge mistake. Uh, we, see, we see election deniers up and down the state, both at the lieutenant governor's office, even here on this commission, we see people who have deny the success of a 2020 election. So to put that in place, on our Fulton Board of Elections as we go into the 2024 presidential election would again have been a mistake, especially knowing that the GOP is nominating two far-right election-denying candidates for their upcoming two-year term. To, we know that we will need thoughtful leadership up and down the board on the commission and the Board of Elections itself leading into this two-year term. So on that issue, that's why we implore the commission to continue being thoughtful on the issue of the Board of Elections. There are people here today themselves who have um, talked about seeming to be oppressed for their views, although they mentioned someone who is well known for being a, a voter suppressor, for working to challenge many voters over and over and over again for the same people. That person is going to be nominated for the board itself. So we implore you to continue making these decisions publicly, open, and instead of doing so behind closed doors, talk to your constituents, answer the phone when they call you. 15 seconds. And we thank you for uh, changing that nomination. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, y'all. My name is Parker Short. I'm the vice president of the Georgia Young Democrats. I'm here to speak about the next generation of Georgia and Fulton voters. First, I'd like to recognize Commissioner Barrett and Commissioner Hall. Y'all have tirelessly fought to oppose this attack on our elections and our democracy. Um, I would like to address you directly, Commissioner Pitts. I mean, to be very frank, I was shocked that a person representing the whole of Fulton County would put an extreme partisan in this role. I urge you to remember, you won your first election by 1,700 votes. You are now looking to oppose a no or support a nominee who does not believe Joe, Joe Biden won the state of Georgia. If you do not believe that, if we have a commissioner that does not believe in elections, y'all should not be sitting in these seats. If you do not believe in your own elections, you should not be serving these people because your elections would not be right either. You are putting forward a candidate that opposed the John, Light, John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Truly, as you sit in these chairs, as you sit in the city of Atlanta, how can you feel confident putting an election denier in this position, doing this to the voters of this community? Not only that, I feel like Mr. Morris is just an embodiment of SB 202. Is that the future of what you want our elections to look like? Sir, I know you are not going to be running for re-election again. I know you do not have to worry about the political consequences. If you do, I will be there making sure that voters remember what you tried to do to our election systems. <laughs> Once again, I must be very, very clear. It is lunacy that he was even considered for this position. And I think it is very clear by the amount of people that showed up this morning that that is not okay. People were mobilized, people were upset because they know what a threat to our democracy looks like. We have faced too many of them in the last several seconds. years. I know. We have faced too many of them in the last several years. And genuinely, to see you use your position of power to elevate the voter suppression that is harming our state and our nation is abhorrent. Joe Biden won the 2020 election. If you don't believe that, you shouldn't be sitting there. Next five speakers, Sabrina Jones, Eric Richardson, Mina Turbury, Demetrius Taylor, and B. Rohr. 
Good morning, commissioners. My name is Rashawn Kemp, and I am a Fulton County resident. Uh, I've also appeared on our very ballot and also uh, served as a poll worker. Uh, first, I just want to commend our youth. I'm a former educator, so I'm just excited to see our next generation come out and speak out. I um, also want to personally thank Commissioner Barrett for responding to my email and for her comments in the AJC defending our democracy. Um, I think it's really important to echo the sentiments that were heard today, and I was honestly not going to get up and speak because everyone has uh, spoken to this topic, but I think it's really important to express the fact that Lee Morris supported Senate Bill 202, and despite that, voters came out and voted. And that is the history of our country, that despite all of the roadblocks that are put in front of us, we still get out and vote. And we will continue to do that. And so I'm glad to have uh, Patrice uh, Perkins Hooker uh, replace this nomination, somebody that has been an advocate for sexually exploited teens and somebody that has been on the board of Hosea Feeds the Hungry. Um, I, I think it's important also to point out that Fulton County is the epicenter of all that is going on in this country. And Yes, we don't want things to be hyper-partisan, but it is. And in the age of Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis, another call will come to Georgia at some point because they're going to lose. And I'm glad to know that somebody that is going to be on that end of that call is not somebody that's going to answer, but somebody that will ignore that phone call. So thank you so much for this change in nomination. With a change of heart. Thank y'all so much. I didn't see this coming because I know my time is running low. This is in my house. And when y'all brought them up and brought out his name, my heart just dropped because he worked for our church and our pastor Tony Moses, who we just lost this year. Don't know officer. Not even my son, Terrell. Neither one of them didn't deserve to leave, lose their life. He didn't see this coming. My son didn't see this coming. And Chairman, well, thank you for not being like Andrew Young. I voted for you. And when I came up in April this year, I sat in that lobby and you turned around, you looked at me with a smile, and you said, hey, how you doing? I can be working for Morehouse College. And I ran into Andrew Young, never spoke to me, never spoke to me. I'm a voter. In middle school, our teacher taught us to vote. I thought voting was not important, but he said to vote. And when y'all sit here and say, we're going to extend y'all time, it mean a lot to me because y'all let me know I needed to vote. But Congress Lewis told us, you get in trouble, you get in good trouble. I'm still here about DeMarco West for what he did to my son and not turning in my son's medical record to Fulton County Jail. And Ms. Hall, I spoke to your assistant, which I know he gave all the document to Michael Scott and did not turn it in, but I would be right. mad. My 15 minister. seconds, ma'am. Thank you. Hello and thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Richardson. I'm a Fulton County resident. I live in the city of South Fulton. I'm also the executive director of the Atlanta North Georgia Labor Council. The Atlanta North Georgia Labor Council is composed of 60 affiliate unions and tens of thousands of members in Fulton County. We believe that protecting the rights of voters and increasing voter access benefits everyone in our community. We want a Fulton County Board of Election chair that is representative of Fulton County and its voters. We support the nomination of Patrice Parker Hooker as BOE chairman and we are glad that you all have rescinded the nomination and have changed your mind. But well, we will be watching. Thank you.
Hello and good day. I'm Bea Rohr and I live in Fulton County. And the question has come up, why was Mr. Morris um, nominated? Perhaps it was his professional experience as a certified public accountant, which would enable him to effectively provide financial oversight of public resources. Or perhaps it was his experience as a lawyer that would ensure that he would work with the board members to adhere to election law. These are things, these are duties of the um, chairman of the Board of Registration and Elections. Or perhaps it was his 30, over 32 years experience as general counsel and chief financial officer for an Atlanta-based architectural engineering firm, which would bring practical and proven experience in matters of financial accountability and knowledge of and adherence to the law, which is also pertinent to serve as chairman of the BRE. So, or perhaps it was his demonstration to effectively support a bipartisan approach to Fulton County election processes, which I believe is what Chairman Pitts was trying to demonstrate as well. For example, he supported the seating, this is Lee Morris, the seating of Kathy Woolard as the current chairperson of the BRE, knowing that she had connections to Stacey Abrams and that Kathy had served as a lobbyist for fair fight action, only to right before her assuming the role of chairperson of the BRE. However, in a bipartisan fashion, Mr. Morris took Kathy's public service into account, as well as the needs of Fulton County, and he actually supported her to become the current chairperson. Passions are very high. I'm very surprised at some of the name calling and label throwing that has been um, exhibited here. That's fine. 15 Passions seconds. Are high. I would like very much for us to have more time to consider Patricia, Patrice Perkins Hooker as the uh, chairman for the Board of Registration and Elections. There was plenty of time for people to, more, um, to voice their opinions about Lee Morris's appointment. We would like the same. Next five speakers, please come down. Adrian Robertson, Maggie Goldman, Susan Venezia, Brett Cromie, and George Bates. My name is Mina Tarabi. I serve as the chair of the Young Dems of Fulton County, specifically YDATL. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hall, Commissioner Barrett, for keeping us at the forefront of this. Uh, Young Dems stretches from anywhere from middle school, high school, all the way up to the age of 40. Um, everyone quotes John Lewis in the city. He is one of our greatest sons. And he said, voting is not a privilege, it is a right. And we must stand together, fight together, and work together to protect and expand the right of every American citizen. Thank you for rescinding Lee Morris's nomination. Thank you for putting up Patrice Hooker. We are fully behind y'all. If y'all need anything from us, please let us know. But every day we must protect our rights. Fulton County is not only the biggest county in the state, but it is also the road to the White House. It is the road to Congress. It is the road to Senate. We saw it in 2020. And if we get another call like we did in January of 2020, we have to make sure that the person who is sitting over our board and who is sitting there over our elections will make sure that they uphold the integrity of not just Democratic voters, not just Republican voters, but all voters in this county. So thank you. We appreciate you. And we're looking forward to working with you more. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Demetrius Taylor. I hail from College Park, Georgia. And I want to make this quick because my parking is about to run out, OK? <laughs> um, in a perfect world, I wish that we were not so partisan. I wish we would go to moderates, liberals, and conservatives, that we have three different branches of all this uh, to make decisions. Um, we've heard everything here. And my statement is this. Moving forward, if we want to vet people, have more than one candidate there so that everybody is represented, we only got two parties that we're working with. A lot, of, a lot of what you're hearing is because there was only one particular person that you wanted to vet or not vet and got everybody all in the ruckus. If we had one Democrat, one Republican as a thought, then the people would be able to have a choice to say who's the best candidate to move forward. Um, I also want to say this. As the people are here, this is ridiculous that we are timed to 30 minutes to let the people come down here. I see where our College Park mayor got this, this ridiculous idea when it comes to public comments. If the people put you here, the people need to be heard regardless of how much time it takes. If it takes 40 hours, the people want to be heard. 
And yes, it's tedious. Yes, yes, yes. We go over and you're hearing the same things over and over and over again. But the people paid their time. They put, they put their votes out here. And they came down here on the buses, on the trains, spending gas to come down here to be heard. So allow that. Y'all knew this was a hot button topic, so you should have made a special, a, a special meeting specifically for this topic so everybody can be heard. So moving forward, let's try doing that. Thank you. My name is Maggie Goldman, and I live in District 1. I came here today to oppose the nomination of Lee Morris to the Fulton Board of uh, Registration and Elections. And it's my understanding that Lee has uh, withdrawn his name, and uh, Patrice Perkins Hooker has been nominated, and I am pleased with that. Um, I did want to note, um, we seem to have forgotten 2021. Um, my biggest complaint for Lee Morris being nominated is that Three times he had an opportunity to fund, fully fund our elections, and he refused to do so. On May 19th, I sat in this chamber for all three votes. I saw him abstain when we needed four votes, and there were only three votes available. Twice this happened, also on June 2nd. He could have been the fourth vote to fully fund our elections, and he chose not to. And then the final vote, which was on July 14th, um, when, Bob Ellis, if you remember, you quite elaborately mentioned that um, Richard Barron was holding a gun to your head in order to uh, force you to fund the elections. And at that point, there were four Democrats, and Morris still voted no. So either he doesn't believe in fully funding elections, or he was persuaded by the Republican Party in order to vote that way. If he was persuaded by the party, then if he had been chair, there's no saying that the two election deniers that the GOP is putting on um, at the end of the month would not persuade him to do further. So if we cannot trust him to vote for elections funding as a commissioner, I cannot imagine he's actually going to vote for a budget from the Fulton Board of Elections that's also going to fund our elections. I will say, um, Rob Pitts, the most common question I got as I advocated seconds. as I advocated for this today, everyone wanted to know why Rob Pitts nominated a Republican instead of a Democrat. That was the most common question, and I told them to direct their questions to you. Next five speakers, Rory Robichaux, Wanda Mosley, James Woodall, Russell Carlisle, and Myrna Clayton. Repeat the names, please, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk. Rory Robichaux, Wanda Mosley, James Woodall, Russell Carlisle, and Myrna Clayton. All right, next five. Earl Ferguson, Molly Reed Woe, Shanidra Gates, Karen Parrish, and Wendell Muhammad. Derek Jackson. Hold on, hold on. Good morning, commissioners. Um, my name is Shanitra Gates, and I am with the Roswell Housing Authority. Um, I just wanted to come out and tell you guys thank you for your contribution to um, our the redevelopment of our um, housing. Housing. Um, so I wanted to thank you guys for that um, of housing. Oh. Thank, I, I wanted to, I came out to thank you guys. I just wanted to thank you for your contrib the contributions that you're making for our housing author authority. This will allow us to be able to redevelop um, the housing for the senior, for our seniors who were um, relocated this year due to structural issues. And it will also allow us to be able, so that will allow us to be able to provide, bring back our seniors who consider Roswell as their home. And it will allow us to be able 
to create affordable housing for future res residents. So I just wanted to thank you because that means so much to us. I am a resident and my mom was a senior who was displaced and we miss our seniors. Our seniors are the wisdom of our community. They provide us with wisdom and guidance and we miss our seniors and we, would, we look forward to having them come back home to the place they consider home. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Next five speakers, Derek Jackson, Deborah Scott, Ron Shakir, James Davenport, Prophet Curtis Hairston. Hi, I'm Karen Parrish. I'm the board chair of the Roswell Housing Authority. We have, uh, for the last five years, and I've got to give a shout out to Shanitra who just spoke to you. She's a warrior fighting for uh, the, the conditions of housing that the Housing Authority in Roswell provides. She's one of our, she is our tenant commissioner right now. Her mother was drastically affected by the structural issues of the building that we are now in process of trying, attempting to replace. And your uh, grants funding that you voted today in your consent agenda of $2.1 million is gonna be instrumental and very necessary for the redevelopment process. Moving forward, we have an application that we will be submitting this week to the DCA of Georgia to redevelop the 40 unit senior disabled building that we uh, currently have on our, our uh, property that has some serious structural issues. And unfortunately, we had to displace 33 of our uh, legacy uh, residents, some who'd been there for over 40, years on property. And so we're very excited about moving forward and, and rebuilding the property with 102 units, um, hopefully if we are awarded the tax credits that we need. And your gift of 2.1 million, thank you so much again for providing that. We had a six, uh, over $6 million gap in financial support for this project, but 2.1 million has come a long way. The city of Roswell in an unprecedented move that's never happened before is also supporting us with $2 million. And Senator Warnock's office right now has put forward in appropriations $2.5 billion to support that project. So without all of the grant funding that we are being considered for and awarded, we wouldn't be able to make this happen. So thank you again. Ms. Scott. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Scott. I'm the CEO of Georgia Stand Up. How are you? So you certainly got our attention and got us down here today. Thank you so much for that because sometimes when we register people to vote and get them educated, we also have to hold our elected officials accountable. And so part of why we're here today is to commend you for doing the right thing, right? It's the right thing. Um, sometimes history will um, look at us and not look at us individually, but look at us collectively. And so it's always a good time to do the right time, to do the right thing. So I thank you. In addition to that, I wanted to correct a couple of things. In, we know that SB 202 was damaging, but the folks came out anyway because we worked hard. Georgia Stand Up worked hard. Black Voters Matter worked hard. The People's Agenda worked hard. And so that's why in pro-Georgia, in the groups that are part of these coalitions worked hard. But you all are making it harder for us to help democracy when we have to spend time to, to deal with this. But so we thank you for today. We thank you for the shift today because you're gonna represent the people that help to put you in office. On behalf of Georgia Stand Up, we will continue to keep watching. We are also a part of labor, and so we will continue to watch and hold you accountable. But we thank you for the move that you made today. In addition, because we look at transit equity issues, we do want to talk about what is happening with MARTA. So we will be back. Thank you so much. Good morning, Ron Shakir from Southwest Land. I'd like to appreciate the council persons who understand and appreciate the value of public engagement and um, the continuation of that is so important. Um, we are in a housing crisis and, um, and I, I believe that the Fulton County Commissioners ought to consider not just one meeting of the public, Fulton County Public um, Housing, but two meetings monthly 
we are in a crisis. And as the cities in Fulton County expands and grow, for sure, Fulton County responsibilities and work will um, take on greater needs. Uh, when I look at the jail situation and the housing situation in Atlanta, um, in Fulton County in the metropolitan area, it's tied to housing and it's tied to stable housing. And I think it's so important that we put our, give our attention to that. And I want to thank uh, the strong seat that um, Commissioner Khadija is holding right now. It was a seat that was, um, that, that was occupied by a real strong leader, and that was Emma Darnell. And her strength and her continuation and her voice and her wisdom that she shared with other council person is such and um, needed today. But for sure, I would just say that let's pay attention to our, our housing, the citizens who have come forth, the last lady who talked about, a couple of people have talked about how important stable housing is. And, um, and I would like to just say again that I would hope that Fulton County would consider, the council persons would consider having two monthly meetings dealing with housing. Okay, 15 seconds. And I would just say too that I wanna thank this opportunity to be able to engage, but we went from three minutes to two minutes and I would hope that we do not continue in that direction People, voices do matter. Thank you sir, very much for the work you do. L last six speakers, please come down. Margie McLeod, Emma Davids, David Garcia, Bob Herndon, Christine Neighbors, and Marlon Horn. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to be in your presence. Before you are three pictures. I know this mental health month but those pictures, we might be talking about public health. After I finish what I'm saying, you'll understand better. Okay. First, give an honor to God, who I oftentimes call my conductor. I don't have a PhD, but I do have a GOD. I'll get straight to the point. MARTA is deceiving you, okay? Colleague Greenwood is here today to show you a pie chart that is full of nothing but one of those pictures that you have. For several years, we frequented bathrooms at MARTA stations. I've been to them all. The white neighborhoods are immaculate. The black neighborhoods are filthy. He is going to show you a pie chart. I was here the last time he spoke. I was at the Cab County Commission yesterday. That pie chart is full of it. What you have in front of you is a picture from the bathroom from the West End Station. The West End Station, Kensington Station. Kensington Station. This stuff has been in there for days. Mother's Day, I took these pictures. Mother's Day. As I told Atlanta City Council, when they eliminated those bus routes during the pandemic, it was a voter suppression issue. These people imported Collie Greenwood from Canada. We're talking seconds. about a bus driver who's now the CEO of MARTA. Did not make sense. Y'all need to do your job, strip MARTA of their ability to actually keep deceiving you. You all have the power to tell MARTA to stop to do a cease and desist, stop right now. Thank you, sir. Stop going for this bull, which he's about. Thank you, next speaker. Amen, everybody, praise the Lord, Jesus Christ. Um, I'm here to talk about homelessness and if we will allow people to live underneath your bridges, and die underneath your bridges. But people are living underneath your bridges, not too far from this place, and dying out there in the wintertime and summertime due to homelessness. Now, if you will allow that, what else won't you allow? Okay, a man just died in your Fulton County jails, and y'all come down here and celebrate police officers. The police officer force is 85% black folk. Y'all walk past that jail cell 
and you allowed a man to die in your jail cell. You walk past him. Now, according to my Bible, the Bible says that you reap what you sow, whether it be good or bad. Now, like I said before, as a prophet of God, if God don't judge you, and if God don't send some, some judgment toward you, then I'm not a man of God. You need to write that down. Now, like I said before, if y'all are going to continue to do unjustified things in those seats, we're going to have to find somebody else to put in these seats. And we're going to we're gonna have to find the same type of caliber people to put in these seats. Because this is becoming a, what's the right word, a, one of those big words y'all use to try to confuse people? You know, but it's becoming a problem. That's a simple word, problem. It's becoming real bad now. See, these type of things got to stop. See, but if we come down here and get antsy in the pants to watch y'all, y'all say, why are we all antsy in the pants? Because y'all are doing stuff that's unjustifiable according to those seats. See, if y'all don't supposed to do things, like you want to cut people's time short, you can't tell people speak on the same issue, that's simple. That's, that's against the law. We pay your salary. 15 seconds. Things have got to change. See, if, people come, if I bring 500 people, homeless people down here and put them in these seats, then y'all look at them funny and say, why are they sneaking and why are they doing it? Because y'all are doing that. Y'all have this city, this city, money is funded for this city. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. David, I'm going to take my hat off so you'll know who I am. I'm wearing a shirt that says, take your souls to the polls. I'm here in opposition of the act of trying to put, a, put something together without input from the people. I don't have anything against anybody that you put forward. I have a problem with the process. Holy Spirit told me to ask you to please read Psalms 52, if you've got a Bible. Psalms 52. But today I'm concerned because I don't see you working in the best interest of the people. When you ran, you said, I want to. But serve, ask, serve, serve you. Not serve me, serve you. Everything that you do affects us. We need you. And, and, and Commissioner Rob Pitt, I'm so sick of seeing you walk out that door when these proclamations are made. I'm sick of you watching your watch to see how much time. You told me in, in last year in December when you were handing out food that you needed one more time. We gave that to you. But guess what? I might just want to do a movement to recall you. You need to stop being insensitive to what's going on with the people that you say you want to S-E-R-V-E. I need you to take notice of that. I didn't know until I read something else the other day that my, my council person was also supporting not being able to vote. That's the democratic process. Let us know what's going on so we can come down here and let you know what we need. 15, 15 seconds. minutes. 15 seconds. Thank you. I am so sick of your attitude letting me know that you don't care anything about the people that you say you want to represent. And I need the Lord to speak to you to let you know you need help. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Next speaker. Hold on one second. Is the mic? Um, thank you so much, Chairman, and thank you uh, for the commission for giving us time to, some extra time to speak. My name is Kristen Neighbors. I'm the state director for All Voting is Local Action. We are a nonpartisan organization that advocates for policies that improves voter access and aids counties in running smooth elections. I was here to speak about the nomination of Lee Morris, and I want to thank him for considering the impact he would have had as chair of the board. So instead, I want to use my time um, to add to the concerns raised earlier about the two upcoming nominees, particularly Jason Frazier, who has brought 12 different voter challenges to the Fulton BRE since the beginning of 2022. He's wasted countless hours of staff and uh, board time. Um, Jake Evans is the other nominee that is upcoming for the BRE. He was arguing that Trump won the election in the Supreme Court. Um, I recognize that the board, the BRE, should absolutely be bipartisan, but this should not be a bipartisan issue, that election deniers do not belong on the BRE. Um, 
and particularly in Fulton County, where we know that Fulton is a frequent target for conspiracy theorists, everything this board does will be under heavy scrutiny through the 2024 election. We also know that Fulton voters are 56% voters of color who have long faced increased barriers to voting. I'm sure most folks in this room would agree that it's really important that our board of elections be made up of members who will promote increased voter access, especially through this critical election. Um, I think Ms. Perkins Hooker reflects the values of the, voter, uh, the, the voters of Fulton County. I think she's an excellent choice for BRE chair, but I would encourage you to really consider all candidates carefully and give the public lots of time um, to consider all the candidates on our five-person BRE. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Rob Picks, I'm glad you changed your mind, or they made you change your mind. But I didn't come down, I come down here. I was a foster parent 10, 15 years ago. And you know I talked to you, that hall I talked to you about it. We do need a task force, because the children, the forgotten children now, is 25 and 32 years old now. And one of the child that was taken out of my house was seven years old. And he came and visited me two weeks ago. I was going to talk about this topic last, week before last. DP, the foster children, the forgotten children, and we forgot about them. They did not get the support. They did not get the help that they needed. And then when you don't do your job, you put the money into it. The case workers, they overwhelmed. They was overwhelmed 15 years ago. They're not getting paid enough money. You need more staff, and you need monitor these children. That's why you need a task force. You got a lot of runaways. You don't even know who ran away because we're not checking. We need to check the group home. They do not report it. And this is dear to my heart. And you know that, Rob Picks, but I talk to you, but you never respond back to me. These children, the forgotten children, if we don't help them, their identity been stolen, they can't get no light bill, they can't buy a house, because guess what? Who stole their identity? And they was in foster care at seven years old, and then somebody took their identity. So that's what we got to fight and help seconds. me to get the uh, hundreds of foster children identity been stolen. So how are we gonna correct this? And that's why they could come and shoot you in your head and look at you, don't feel nothing because you didn't take care of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Next speaker, any others in the assembly hall? No further speakers in assembly hall. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we have two speakers on Zoom and six emailed in comments. All right, 12-17, let's take them. Good, good afternoon, commissioners. The first person to speak is Ben Howard. Greetings, one and all. Ben Howard, Senior Advocate, Public Policy Analyst. Please abide me as I impart some information to seniors and friends of seniors in our county. At the Bowden Senior Multipurpose Facility last week, applications were processed for assistance in summer cooling costs via LIHEAP, the Low Income Heating Assistance Program. On sequentially succeeding weeks this month, applications will be processed at the other multipurpose facilities. For details, contact the Fulton County Star Line at 404-613-6000. Alternatively, one may call the Darnell, the Benson, or the Mills facility, or contact the Fulton Atlanta Community Action Authority at 404-320-0166 or by way of their website, www.facaa.org. On another note, one may call the Starline to volunteer to serve on one of those vibrant committees of the Fulton County Commission on Elder Affairs. Thanks. 
The last person to speak is Nicola Hines. Nicola Hines. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Nicola Hines. I'm the current president for the League of Women Voters, Atlanta, Fulton County. LWBF is one of the oldest nonpartisan civic engagement organizations in this country, uh, as we have been almost 103 years old. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. We at LWBAF works hard to educate, empower, and engage voters throughout Fulton County. I would like to say I appreciate that Chairman Pitts rescinded the nomination of Lee Morris mm -hmm. and for Mr. Morris withdrawing his name. However, it shouldn't have taken the numerous hours and outcry of residents of this county to make this change. As we move into the next election cycle that includes both the presidential and state legislative seats, this nomination is crucial to Fulton County and to Georgia as a whole. Fulton County needs to be at the forefront of efforts to stop polarization of our government. We need a BRE, BRE chair that will put the people before the party. We should be seeking a chair that embraces the spirit of nonpartisanship to represent the interests of Fulton County. Partisan politics has no place among those charged with overseeing our election process. HB 656 intended the structure of the board was to ensure that the chair can remain a nonpartisan, impartial individual that can see the pros and cons of all viewpoints expressed from either side of the aisle. So we encourage you to seek the nominee that inspires trust in all residents, exhibit impartiality to either party, and prioritize the constitutional rights of everyone residing in Fulton County. Thank you for your time. And this concludes the Zoom public comments. We have six emailed in comments. All right, tell us to summarize it. Summarize the emails, please. All right, the first uh, commenter is Angela Payne. Fulton County has to have a chairperson that exhibits fairness and integrity in our elections. I support Lee Mars, which is the recommendation of Chairman Pitts for this position. It is imperative that we can show bipartisan in Fulton County. I support Lee Mars. Others who, who also agree, Julie Allen and Stephanie Miller. Beverly Miller, Lee Mars should not serve on the Fulton County Board of Elections. We need a board that stands for voting rights. It is a terrible idea to have a majority Republican board considering the attempted state takeover of Fulton County elections. Uh, others who agree are Chantel Mullen. This concludes the comments. Anything no further else? speakers. All right, next item. Are we going to the board appointment now? Yeah, the, no, the one that we've moved up without objection, that would be on page 11, 23-0356. Board of e Registration Election, Chairman Pitts has nominated Patrice Perkins Hooker to serve as chair, replacing Kathy Woolard for a full board appointment effective July 1st, 2023, to a term ending June 30th, 2025. All right, I'll open the floor for nominations. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? No other nominations? All right, close the floor. I'll move approval of uh, Patrice Perkins Hooker. We already this. did. It's on the screen. Y'all let me preside, please. Madam Clerk, Commissioner Vice Chair Ellis, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Certainly a lot of statements have been made this morning um, and been on this commission for a while, been, sat through a lot of meetings and I can say that uh, never, never, uh, never fail to get surprised at what may await me when I get down here to start a meeting um, versus what's on the agenda. But uh, I, I just want to take a few minutes, just point of privilege, Mr. Chair, to talk about Lee Morris. Uh, Lee Morris is a good, decent man. He's a man of integrity. He's done nothing to restrict access to the ballot. He's done nothing to underfund budgets. As a matter of fact, our, our budget for elections was $37.4 million last year. They spent $25.5. They underran their budget by 11.9. Elections have not been underfunded. Some of the statements that have been made to characterize and defame, defame Lee Morris, they're shameful, they're unfounded, and they're out of bounds. Um, Lee Morris has enjoyed a close relationship with the past two board chairs, and uh, I'd, I'd venture to say if you had him before us, they would say he would be a fine board chair as well. He's never been afraid throughout his political career to take tough positions and make tough decisions, regardless of wherever, you know, his, 
as party might be, Lee, Lee was focused on doing the right thing and, um, and fully upholding the law. He's competent, he's qualified, he's unbiased, he knows the law, and he would have been an excellent chair of the Board of Reg Registration and Elections for all citizens of this county. And personally, I think he was the right person at the right time for our county, our state, and our country. I think this is a miss missed opportunity and a loss for all Fulton County citizens. Um, I, know, I know Commissioner Morris, and I've seen him be defamed in ways that uh, are just, you know, totally uncalled for. And I'm not going to sit up here and let that go by today and have him to be continue to be defamed. When it's certainly without me, the statements of many of the statements have been made were completely unfounded without any merit. Commissioner Thorne. I would like to echo um, Commissioner Ellis's statements. Um, but as a, a new commissioner, I'm just really, really concerned about the public being able to comment, being able to voice their concerns. I, I agree. I think there was a speaker, Saya Abney. Um, they did a great job about we need, a, we need to be even. We need to respect each other's opinions. We don't look, we're not just a Democrat county. We are Fulton County. We have independents, Republicans, Democrats, and everybody deserves a voice and a right to chime in. As a citizen, when Kathy Woolard was approved, commissioners mentioned how they, who didn't know her, got to go have lunch with her, got to speak to her, got to know her. Me as a commissioner, I know who Patrice is, but I don't know her. And now I'm told to vote her on a very, very important position for this county without even having anybody be prepared to come down to speak for her against her. She looks like she's a, a great woman. And when I've talked to her, she's been very responsive as a lawyer on the BRE. But I don't know her. I don't know where she stands. And I think it's unfair that I am not able as a commissioner to be able to vet her, to meet her. And I just want to echo some of the emails that I got from Democrats this week. Because this was put on the Friday agenda. Commissioner Pitts did the proper thing, had it on Friday morning. It gave public plenty of time to research, chime in, make plans to come down here. And now, nobody can come down here and speak about Patrice Perkins unless they just happen to be here. So I just want to read the letters I got. Dear Fulton County Commissioner Bridget Thorne, I am a person of faith and a resident of Fulton County, Georgia. As a faith leader in my community, I believe that listening to and hearing from our neighbors is one powerful way we love each other. Your decision to rush a vote that would determine our next Fulton County board chair is not allowing for feedback and input from our county and community. In selecting someone for a hugely important position that would oversee our 2024 elections in the county, that is why I am demanding you postpone the Wednesday, May 17th vote for Fulton County Election Board Chair and allow more time for the community input. Our voices deserve to be heard, and as residents of the county, we deserve better. With our future elections on the line, this is too important to rush. The people must be heard first. Thank you, Edith Maudlin Higgin. I got the same letter from Patrick Carter, Lee Walker, Bernadette Hartfield, Judy Boatwright-Stewart, June R. Bishop, Senate Twice, Lee Campbell-Taylor, Ellen Logan, Elaine Ebdy, Allison Matthews, and Melanie Hembry. I got another letter. Hi, my name is, and then parentheses, your name. I'm a Fulton County resident. I'm calling you to ask that you postpone this Wednesday's vote for our Board of Elections Chair. We need more time for this important decision for the public to weigh in and additional nominations who reflect the diversity 
of Fulton County to be considered. Thank you. And that was from Patty King, Phyllis Spearman, David Weinzimmer, Daniel J. Starr, Jessica Godfrey, Karen Katz, and Kabibi Springs. And then I got a few variations of the same letter from Deborah Merritt, Timothy Williams, and David Winky. Well, I guess when the shoe's on the other foot, it's plenty of time to approve the BRE. This isn't a critical decision. We don't need the public to chime in. We don't need preparation. We just kind of do a switcheroo, which I think is totally unfair, and I just wish we could have some consideration on both sides, whether you're Democrat or Republican. Because I ran to represent this entire county. I didn't run just to represent Republicans. I want to do the best for everybody. And by this rushing of this nomination, I can't. My hands are tied. The people in my district do not have representation. And I just hope you all would appreciate it. And I, and I too, want to read, um, Commissioner Morris was unfairly said that he was against SB 202, that he's for voter suppression. Actually, two of the meetings, he voted against the Happy Faces contract. I don't know how that's voter suppression. It was a Happy Faces worker contract, which we've kind of quietly haven't used as much. We brought in Dover staffing as a commissioner. Still not sure how that happened, but we just kind of gradually phase people out. Our voter rolls are just quietly being cleaned. Pennsylvania, recently five counties in Pennsylvania, um, a lawsuit was just one because they failed to clean their voter rolls. Their chairs refused to clear their voter rolls, so I'm happy that we're doing it, quietly doing it so that nobody gets upset. But I'd like to read what um, Commissioner Morris said about SB 202, that it, it, there was a resolution saying it was Jim Crow 2.0, that it was voter suppression. He said, thank you. This, you know, is tough. It's a really tough issue. I, you know, I'm old enough. I'm old enough to remember the days when I participated in the marches and protest about the unfairness in this country toward people of color. And I was glad to be involved in those efforts. I think we've seen an awful lot of progress. The law, this law is not, if I were pro voting, I probably wouldn't have included all those issues, but in the bill, but there are, there are some things that I think are improvements in the way we vote. I worry really about the divisiveness on both sides and understand there is no way that a white man in America could understand the feelings that people of color are having about these really important issues. And I hear you, I do. And I, Commissioner Abdu Rockman, I really appreciate your passion on this issue. I do. I do see it being partisan on both sides, and that's sad. I think, I think we could do better as a country and as a state. But I, I look at it, and I have it in front of me, an article from April 6th in, right. in the five, Atlanta Journal. Five, yeah, five more minutes. And it says, wait, I, as a commissioner? I, Ten minutes. On a, OK. So anyway, he says, um, I would love to see the day when we don't, and we don't have to debate about voter suppression and Jim Crow laws and everything else. I'm hopeful that when my grandchildren grow up to be adults, that this will be all behind us. Anyway, that's all I really have to say. And then Commissioner Abdurakhman responded, um, I just want to say to my friend, my dear friend from years ago, Commissioner Lee Morris, we've been knowing each other for years. Commissioner Lee Morris has supported my candidacy in the past. He's an old time friend of mine and I respect his comments and I agree with him on this. I hope one day, Commissioner Morris, that we won't have to have these conversations. But unfortunately, today is not the day. But I appreciate you, thank you. So I just wanna reach out to trying to build bridges, not be partisan. We have got to stop this. You can't just come down and say, oh, we have to have Democrats. We have to have the best people for the job. And I hope someday we can do that. We can judge people by their character, not by their political party. Thank you. Commissioner Hall. <sighs> 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I too re received those emails. There may have been only about two dozen, but I also received these emails, and this was strong opposition against a vote for Lee Morris. This, and this is just at my Fulton County email address. It doesn't include the DMs in my Instagram inbox on my personal and my county, the messages in my Facebook Messenger on my personal and my county, and personal text messages, all saying vote no. So the people were heard, but what's most concerning to me are the backroom dealings that I was told that took place concerning such an important vote, such an important position that should be about the people. I learned about this on Friday, and I want to thank Commissioner Dana Barrett for her strength and her courage to speak out, because that's the only way that I knew what was going on. She is the reason for the call to action to hear from the constituents countywide. She wanted everybody to be able to weigh in, and so thank you for that, Commissioner Barrett. So we received many more than just a few dozen who said, please postpone it. We received a lot of absolutely not, and they weren't just from Democrats. They were from Republicans, too, because everybody just wants someone who's going to do the right thing, and I think that would absolutely be Patrice Perkins Hooker. So I'm thankful that we have this uh, vote coming up. And uh, I know that we will all vote favorably because this is the right person to represent everyone. Thank you. Commissioner Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Commissioner Hall. Um, I just want to say that uh, I'm in full support of Patrice Perkins Hooker. She has an incredible uh, resume. She is an honors graduate of Georgia Tech. She has a law degree from Emory University. She served as the county attorney of Fulton County, as general counsel for the Atlanta Beltline. Um, the community, uh, she served the community as the chair of the Atlanta Board of Zoning Adjustments and chair of the Emory Business School Alumni Board. She's a member of the Gate City Bar Association Hall of Fame. Um, winner of many awards, uh, vice chairwoman of, served as vice chairwoman of the Hosea Feed the Hungry, uh, served as secretary for the Georgia State Bar Association, and served as the first black president of the Georgia State Bar Association. So she is incredibly accomplished. And while, um, you know, my, my colleague uh, did not have time to vet her, uh, we have been talking about her for days, and, along with a lot of other qualified candidates. Um, so I'm very, very excited to have her um, as the substitute nominee. Vice Chair Ellis. Um, well, it's good to know that somebody's been talking about her for days, so to the point, I guess, of backroom dealings. But the, my question is on, um, this is really relates to her nomination. Uh, but Ms. Ms. Hooker is currently the Board of Elections Attorney, correct? Correct. This is to the county attorney, my question on this. But thank you for confirming on that. But so we've got certain cases that, are, that she is representing us specifically right now on? Um, she, she does uh, provide representation in legal matters and SCB hearings for the Board of Re Registration and Elections. Okay. Um, I don't know. The question is: Does does this does this potentially create a conflict with her being nominated to move from that role to this role, and or what's going to take place within a piece of litigation where she was providing the representation? How would that be backfilled, et cetera? Um, while my office was not aware that she was under consideration for this until this morning, I would imagine that um, if she were to become the chair of the BRE. A uh, separate counsel would be retained to take over the matters in which she was legal representative for the BRE. 
your opinion, does it create any, does that create any conflict at all? Um, at first blush, I do not believe so because her role as their legal counsel is to preserve their interests and look out for their interests and that would be the same if she were the BRE chair. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Any other comments? All right, motion on the floor is to approve. Let's vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, four yeas, zero nays. Next item, Madam Clerk. Back on page six, presentations to the board, 230337, Marta Quarterly update. Mr. Greenwood. Right. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Pitts, uh, commissioners, staff. I want to also recognize the MARTA board members um, in attendance is uh, board member Stacy Blakely, and also observing online is um, Frida Hartage and Al Pond. Wanted to thank you for your time today and allowing us to present our quarterly uh, briefing. Uh, the Q2 briefing is primarily so that I can tell you more about the proposed MARTA FY24 budget and highlights as they uh, pertain to Fulton County. Noting, of course, that there are two public hearings on the matter. One was last night at Decatur Public Library, and the other one is tomorrow online um, at 6 p.m. You can get more information about that at itsmarta.com. Next slide, please. Uh, as you might expect, our strategic priorities provided uh, the guiding principles in this budget exercise as we execute on our mission to advocate for and provide a safe multimodal transit service that advances prosperity, connectivity, and equity uh, for a more livable region. So you'll find evidence of this uh, throughout the series of slides. Next slide, please. And I'll start by focusing on uh, Fulton specific highlights in our capital program specifically the state of good repair and expansion budgets before going into the, the system-wide operating budget and system-wide capital program. So on this slide, you'll find that, uh, I'll, I'll, well, I'll talk about the first three in more detail in the, in the subsequent slides, but for now, I just wanna talk about safe routes to transit, the last one there. Um, we've received strong support from our congressional delegation uh, in this area where we will add pedestrian infrastructure such as uh, sidewalks, ADA ramps, and crosswalks where it is lacking. Of course, we're gonna prioritize this at high ridership, high ridership bus stops, and especially where we have recently added uh, bus shelters and amenities. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll start with uh, College Park Station um, as, as one of the items listed on the, on the slide prior when we talked about uh, station rehabilitation. So College Park is the one that we identified. So we've got $4 million involved in the FY24 budget uh, on a $31 million overall project for College Park. But, but this is just an example of what, what we're doing at College Park in the interim. So uh, we had a nice event just a few weeks back there to celebrate the plaza renovation completion. It's important for us to acknowledge the milestones along the way. So um, pavers, landscaping, painting, parging, uh, clear sight lines, repair, replace, damage um, poles and fences. These things in and of themselves might not sound like something to acknowledge, but the people gathered to celebrate at College Park that morning would, would tell you otherwise. This approach will continue with $4 million slated for spend in FY24, um, and you can look for pavers being replaced along the subway platform and throughout the station, and uh, as well as parking lot pavement. Next slide, please. East Point Smart Restrooms. So the Smart Restroom at East Point is open, along with HE Homes, GWCC, and Doraville. It's electronically monitored for movement, supplies, and access on a full-time basis. Um, it, act, it increases access and safety in these facilities, and we use modern finishes, which are easier to clean. 
Um, I invite questions on this topic at the end of the session if any of the, of the commissioners here would like to ask questions, and I can, uh, I can make comment at that point. Um, more importantly, we're ensuring that no matter which station you're going to, wh wherever you board, uh, your, start your trip, whichever station you go to, it will also have a smart restroom. Uh, we're installing at 37 stations, and, and airport will already have uh, washroom access. Next slide, please. So when it comes to bus shelters and amenities, we'll have critical mass of the FY23 requirement by this fall. Uh, as always, sometimes you know, we do run into delays when it comes to the design. It take, takes a month to design these, three months to permit them at some times, and construction will take up to a month. Um, but we are, we are continuing to focus on this and making sure that we're in good position to deliver on another 50 in FY24. Next slide, please. And uh, to turn that into a picture, this is what this is what those efforts look like. I like to draw, you know, bring one of these slides at the uh, conclusion of every one of our smart um, or shelter amenities slides, because it really has the the effect of kind of turning translating numbers on a page into the tangible improvements for for our people. So if you are waiting for a, this. This particular installment was done in January, January 23rd to be exact. So if I was waiting for a, a bus at West Park and Boulder prior to January, I would have been out there exposed to the elements, possibly getting rain soaked, uh, sun drenched, standing in a puddle. Uh, because of these efforts, uh, after January, I would be well protected from the elements, a place to sit, a place to you know put refuse or garbage, uh, system map and, and um, solar powered lighting. So it makes a big difference. Um, also protects me from the, the traffic zooming past. Uh, so we will have uh, $4 million in the FY24 budget to continue this program on a $25 million budget, dollar budget overall. Uh, next slide, please. So when it comes to capital projects expansion, there are these one, two, three, four main items, main buckets that we'll be spending money on in FY24. Uh, and I'll get into each of them in detail on the next slide. So next slide, please. When it comes to South Fulton Parkway and Roosevelt Highway, just a quick update on some of those. Uh, with South Fulton, of course, that was identified in the Fulton County Transit Master Plan and in the 15th Amendment for High Capacity Transit. Um, the scope of this planning work involves identifying the most favorable alignment and most uh, suitable mode for the corridor. We'll conduct key stakeholder engagement in the summer of 2023. We'll prepare implementation plans for the selected alignment and mode and bring that to 30% design. We'll also develop high level cost estimates and identify available funding opportunities, including the capital investment grant or the CIG. We uh, also plan to hold public meetings uh, with public and elected officials on this file and evaluating four modes, uh, heavy rail, light rail, bus rapid transit and articulated rapid transit to come to some conclusions. We will also expand this scope west of the Douglas County line. Uh, this is a corridor length that's approximately 25 miles. Uh, we also have the Roosevelt Highway on the right-hand side. And, and again, this is a part of the Fulton County Master Plan, uh, Transit Plan, and that recommended investment along the Roosevelt Highway between College Park Station and the city of Palmetto. So this approximate 19-mile corridor is, um, is undergoing early planning work, and MARTA is doing that. We're again trying to determine the ART stop locations and evaluate the needs for, for enhancements. We're conducting key stakeholder outreach in the late summer of this year, and we'll complete feasibility studies and determine the best ART alignment options uh, on the file. Um, again, that is, um, so that's what we're doing on those two files. Next slide, please. The automated transit network feasibility study. This is something that we're, we're conducting a financial feasibility, feasibility assessment of the automated transit network for system implementation. We're gonna be supporting the airport CID in the issuance of a request for proposals for ATN demonstration pilot project in conjunction with the city of College Park between the SkyTrain area and the Georgia International Convention Center. A uh, million dollars identified to contribute towards this study this year so we can have information to share with you and develop uh, proposals for uh, feasibility of a, of a product like this in Fulton County. Next slide, please. 
We we'll also want to update you on the Georgia 400 express lane transit and the I-285. So the BRT, the Georgia 400 was, was the concept there, of course, was a BRT within the GDOT uh, State Route 400 express lanes project. And that would take you from North Springs to the Windward Parkway uh, park and ride facility. Um, this, this project is ongoing. The, it's, uh, it's progressing as GDOT is continuing to advance the process to select the designer and the builder for the express lanes. We have partnered with the North Fulton CID and the state area planning, looking at existing conditions and pedestrian connectivity, and we're wrapping up the market study in early June. Our legal team is also coordinating with GDOT uh, on a revised IGA to address station area access during construction. And MARTA is also seeking to determine grant opportunities like the FTA CIG Small Starts Grant to, uh, to, to help further fund this project. And on the right, you'll see the I-285 project. Again, this is a BRT concept within the GDOT I-285 express lanes from HE Holmes to Indian Creek Station. And the role here for MARTA is to participate with the project working group in visioning, scoping, planning, and conceptual engineering of the, of the design. We'll also, of course, be heavily involved with public engagement, stakeholder communications, and environmental assessments. Um, but we recently, the good news here is that we recently selected the CDM Smith team to do the planning work on the top end BRT study. And the, the ATL is scheduled to take the contract to their June 1st board meeting for adoption. The policy working group met in April of 2023 and will continue to meet quarterly. Next slide, please. So on a more general level, MARTA has engaged in its annual budget cycle process, and I wanted to share highlights of the operating and capital proposals. So the next slide. We've been going uh, to jurisdictions and speaking about uh, what's happening in our budget, and I always like to start with, look, we're, we're talking to you about how we're setting the table financially for FY24, so it behooves us to talk a little bit about what we were able to achieve in FY23. A lot of success to talk about here. I won't go into the details, but from a hiring perspective, it's no secret that across the country, transit and other industries were, were hard fought, um, hard pressed, sorry, to, to find employees. But MARTA did step up on a, you know, at one point on a 1,300 operator base, we were 250 operators short. We have now eliminated that gap, but it wasn't without this kind of effort, 110% increase in the amount of of bus hires going on. Our ridership is a success story with nearly six million more revenue miles in FY23 year to date over FY22. Um, in, in comparison to pre-COVID numbers, I mean the, the quick um, comparator there is that our mobility ridership is now back to 88% of what it was pre-COVID. Our bus ridership is back to 62% and our rail ridership is back to 50% and even in the case of rail ridership, we've demonstrated the capacity to do more as evidenced when Janet Jackson and Taylor Swift ended up being scheduled on the same night and MARTA was able to move crowds reminiscent of uh, the crowds we, we supported during the Super Bowl. So uh, the capacity is there. We're, we're spending in a, in a manner that will support that capacity. And I actually believe that you, you do need to um, to spend your way out of a ridership slump. So we are making sure that we're able to uh, address and accommodate those increased loads as they come. Um, financially, we had a very strong year. Uh, we're, uh, we're more dynamic and comprehensive in our project cost modeling due to our HDR tool, which we just brought on a, a month or so ago. We got top marks from the International Financial Standards Bearers. Uh, we are always seeking efficiencies, and that's perhaps one of the reasons we got top marks, but there we you see we saved $15 million uh, in the past year from innovative refinancing initiatives, and we're always proven competitive in securing federal funds. Next slide, please. More successes, safer and more secure. Uh, we heard the concerns throughout the year, throughout the years, and we share them, so we continue working towards the goal of being one of the safest transit agencies in the country. Um, regardless of whether the hazard is intended or unintended, that is whether it's a security or a safety risk, MARTA is, um, is focused on, on eliminating those. So the bottom dash under safe and more secure talks to the, the pure safety issue, which is the unintended hazards. So GDOT has given us a really good, clean bill of health in terms of their triangle safety audit. Uh, we've closed all of the corrective action plans from the previous audits and we're moving forward. 
And when it comes to the security aspect, you can see there a 17% reduction in the serious crimes and a 42% reduction in operator assaults. Um, and then, of course, stronger connections into the community. We're just improving the MARTA brand through stronger connections. That's whether it's soccer in the stations, more managers in the stations, art bound installments on the system, helping with voter registration or food in the MARTA markets. These are all designated and designed to help strengthen ties in the community as we move people forward. Next slide, please. So here are the numbers for the FY24 plan service levels. In a nutshell, what I'm trying to um, illustrate here is that if you look at FY 2019, which was pre-pandemic, and you look at FY 24, you can see that we're putting our money where our mouth is, and we are funding uh, the ability to schedule the same level of service that we had pre-pandemic. Pre and it's important, as I said, because you lead ridership with service, and revenue ridership remains a significant part of our revenue stream. In fact, passenger revenues are, in fact, the second largest contributing factor to our overall fund picture. So if you go to the next slide, we can get into that pie chart, and it, it shows you passenger revenues there at 13% is actually the, you know, the second largest revenue stream that we, that we enjoy. Of course, more than half of our revenue comes from operating sales tax revenues, so we are forever grateful for the, the financial position that the state is in um, and the policies that allow um, funds to continue flowing our way. The second largest, as I said, is passenger revenues at 82.7 million. And the third largest is federal funding, uh, which is composed of mainly Section 5307 preventative funds for um, um, state of good repair, uh, maintenance funding, and that's $81.5 million, which accounts for 13% of our revenue. Next slide, please. Of course, we have expenses, and uh, you'll see here that labor and benefits and overtime comprise almost two-thirds of our operating expenses, which is consistent with the industry, and you might expect that in, a, in such a resource-dependent operation. The next highest category at 17% is our contractual services category, which includes mobility services, um, IT licensing fees, fare collection equipment maintenance, passenger facilities maintenance, and external litigation. Um, next slide, please. Oh yeah, so th this is the, uh, the capital sources and uses chart. So this allows us to really look at the planned capital sources and uses for FY24. In a nutshell, it tells you that the capital plan assumes a total capital program of $855 million in expenses. So we're gonna be spending $855 million in FY24 on, on those categories. This includes $456 million for state of good repair, $218 million for more Marta City of Atlanta, $29 million for more Marta Clayton County, and the budget also includes $152 million in debt service payments, specifically for the State of Good Repair program. Total sources of funds uh, budgeted in FY24 are slightly under $1.2 billion, with a $541 million in FY23 carryover funds from all sources, and $617 million in FY24 generated funds so that includes $125 million of issuance of debt to support the state of good repair. So MARTA therefore expects to carry forward $304 million of funds at the end of FY24. Next slide, please. Taking a more detailed look at your FY24 state of good repair portion of the capital budget, we'll start with the sources of revenue, which total about $626 million. So the largest source of funding is capital sales tax, which we spoke about, and that accounts for 42% of total funding. We also plan to use $150 million from the unified reserve, the carry, carry forward. Uh, and so the prior year carry forward um, of $541 million, 150 of that will be used in FY24. We'll also count on $84 million in federal grants, which includes formula, competitive, and CRISA funding, with CRISA being the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplementary Appropriations Act. Next slide, please. The FY24 State of Good Repair Uses category, or expenditures, includes debt service, um, and, and it's budgeted $608 million. So the expenditures are separated by the five FTA categories, uh, asset categories as well as debt service. And the largest category for investment in FY24 is, uh, is for systems at $112 million. So a few examples of that are elevator and escalator rehab for 20 million and automatic fare control, oh sorry, fare collection 
at, uh, at $10 million. So that's the AFC 2.0 plan. The next highest category is non-asset uh, at $110 million, and that includes design for the Five Points Transformation Project, the environmental health and safety professional services that we enjoy, um, things like making sure that MARTA knows what it's doing when it comes to confined space entry, water management, and, and water waste management, and, uh, and other hazardous materials assessments and abatement. So we want to make sure that we continue to spend that money to keep the system running safe. Um, and facilities and stations represent our third highest category at 105.5 million. Uh, the largest project there is station rehab. So, I mean, I like to say that we, we are, um, you know, we are a, an expensive system to maintain. We are one of the larger systems in, uh, in North America. Um, and, and we are replete with all kinds of, you know, what I call the expensive underbelly of running an operation. 48 bridges, 23 tunnels, 100 and four miles of track uh, com complete with, um, you know, associated systems like power systems, electrical systems, communication systems that keep the, the trains uh, spaced properly. We have 266 vertical circulation units, that's elevators and escalators. All of these things as we speak require maintenance and, uh, and so that's why the, the budget in, when it comes to maintenance is so rich. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to give you just a quick snapshot of our state of good repair, the top 10 projects. Uh, those top 10 will combine for 50% of, of our overall FY24 budget, um, and they're listed there. And again, you know, you'll see that these are projects that affect the system. These are projects that, by and large, are uh, helpful um, for everyone that uses, uses our system. And then on the next slide, I just want to give you a good sense of what happens next year. So these, we had a board briefing and re received feedback from our board at a retreat on May the 9th. We're engaging in public hearings, as I said, uh, yesterday and tomorrow. We've got proposed budgets being provided to each jurisdiction, much like we are doing today. And then the board committee presentation will be on May 25th, which will give the time, the board time to uh, review and hopefully vote to adopt on June 8th. And with the next slide, Chairman Pitts, I will thank you and return the floor to you. All right, questions, uh, Vice Chair Ellis. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, before I get into all my remarks, yeah, thanks to Marta for help. I'm sure Taylor Swift's thankful for you helping her make her three-day errors to her success here in Atlanta. Uh, but the uh, couple things I want to get at. Number one, I mean, the um, if I did my math right, I think that. Funding coming to MARTA, estimated to come to MARTA next year is about $630 million in sales tax um, and about $165 million between capital and operating from federal grants and so forth. So technically, ridership is not the second highest, it's the third highest in terms of your revenue sources overall contributed to capital and operating, correct? No, I, well, let me double check that. I, I am, I'm certain that ridership for provides, operating, for, but in a combined, for, for operating, but in a combined basis, it's, it's in terms of to go into it's the third, Correct. right? Yeah. So, so this just just to be clear on that in terms of just you know the total bucket. Um, one suggestion, I mean, and certainly this is one of the few opportunities, and we do have some folks that have come in and made public comment relative to MARTA. You know, in this session we have them in other and sometimes in other sessions as well. So this is one of the few times um, MARTA you know has an opportunity to appear before you know bodies like us. It would be helpful. And I think we got this presentation yesterday, maybe. So every time you do a quarterly update, our agenda is released on a Friday. It would be helpful to have your operating update within that Friday packet versus you appearing before us and us just seeing it right here. I'm not sure the utility of it, just sort of seeing it sort of cold, this, you know, in, you know, first time really, you know, either the night before or in the morning is particularly really productive for spending, you know, however much amount of time that we just spent on that. And within it, I think it would be useful if you could include to us an executive summary of the key points in which you were trying to convey to us to allow us more an opportunity for dialogue in these sessions as opposed to just sort of a presentation dump. So I don't mean to be critical, but I just think for, I think that's a missed opportunity for us and for all of our citizens to 
um, to have that. So, um, and within the report itself, and you know, I'm a little bit frustrated by this because in prior iterations of this, I've asked for it. Sometimes we have some stuff in there. Sometimes we don't have stuff in there. So it, you know, I think I understand we want to try to pinpoint things that are maybe successes, but I also think we also need to be realistic and show people realities, right? And one of the things that's not been a sort of consistent way to view it, each and every report we should have it, is ridership. By mode, going back to 2019 to where we are today. And that's not, never been consistent with any of these reports. So I would like to see that starting with the next report, continuing in the following report, continuing the following report, on and on and on and on. And I've made that ask before, and it's just not consistently been in here. There's a note in here about some ridership being up in a particular category, but that's just a bullet point, you know, kind of frame of reference. So I would like to see that going forward, you know, within the scope of the report. So uh, with respect, Commissioner right. Ellis, uh, this will be the first um, quarterly briefing that I've done that doesn't have the ridership by mode since 2019 on it. So we, we typically do give you that number. It's well, a, it's, it's not a, in here now, No, right? it's, not, I mean, it's, so. it's not in here now, sir, because this is largely a budget review. So this, right. so in, in the absence, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk well, about I, those in detail, but, but the, the comment that we haven't done it is unfair because this is okay. the first time that you're not seeing it. Okay. Well, that's, you know, to me, these things look different every time I get them. So it's maybe, consistent. maybe that's, it's maybe that's unfair, chart. but I'd like to see it in every report that you provide us. You know, we, we only get these quarterly. I think we should look at them quarterly, see what the trends are. That's, that's my point. Um, my other question for you is relative to um, the crime stats and so forth. Um, it, it'd be useful to have a little bit more um, information about trending on that sort of stuff as well, other than just seeing sort of a reduction and any insight into, you know, where those are occurring within the system. So, yeah, we, again, in the interest of trying to be concise on a, on a budget briefing, we mm -hmm. didn't, we didn't spell that out, but we can, I, I take your point and I'd be happy to boast about our, okay. our crime program and we'll bring that forward in the next quarterly briefing. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all my remarks. Thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Thorne. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've received some emails, and maybe it's another time that we talk about it, but the treatment of the homeless on MARTA, I didn't know if there was any attempts to look at the issues, look at solutions, the most humane solutions to protect the riders as well as the, the yeah. homeless. Um, I don't know if you can speak on that today. Happy to have a conversation later. If not. Thank you, Commissioner Thorne. It, I mean, it's, it's a very important subject uh, for us. MARTA has been... Um, teaming up with Hope Atlanta for a number of years now. Uh, we recognize that homelessness is not a crime and we don't intend to treat homeless people as if it were. Uh, we also recognize though that, you know, um, um, a home is, is not a bus and a home is not uh, a train. So we are working with Hope Atlanta. We've had some good successes in the past year in terms of reunifications with families. Um, um, uh, reunifications with services, helping people to, I think, um, I, I, I think it was at a, at a different briefing, I was able to share, you know, kind of a, um, a specific um, uh, story from one of the folks that were homeless and they kind of walked through what MARTA did for them with the Hope Atlanta team. It's just anecdotal, of course, but it's, it's what we're aspiring to. It takes a very long time to move that needle and it's not something, as, as you know, it, that's um, specific to MARTA. It's a, it's a city, it's a country effort. But to answer the question, our view is that it's not a crime. We're taking it seriously. We're partnering with the community agencies that are there to help us. And what we really need is a place for people. So what we really need is a, is a housing solution and a, and a program solution to assist people so that they don't feel that, that the bus is the best place for them. Thank you. Um, and one other thing, you mentioned on your slide that you're going to be doing voter registrations. Are you going to be working with uh, our election office, DeKalb's election offices, or how do you plan? What's the process? Right, that, that reference was part of our 20, FY23 successes, so it's just talking about how we've worked in the past. It's not a commentary on the future, 
but uh, we always stand ready to assist um, with that type of thing in terms of in engaging the community and making sure that MART is a part of a solution if we want to make sure that registration is occurring. And you mentioned you're doing it at stations. Are those MARTA stations, bus stations, train stations? Yeah, we, we have we have done it in, I mean, I don't have the details with me, but we have done it, uh, you know, um, in stations. We've done it with um, adjacent to stations at lar larger venues. So, um, w again, we can come back to you with, a, with an update on what types of assistance we've been able to provide in that regard. Yeah, I would, I, and I'd like to know if... Um, if you're doing the actual voter registrations, or are you oh, no. having someone transportation? Else? Transportation's doing. No, no, we're uh, we're providing uh, transportation to the okay. sites where registrations happen. Okay, because yeah. uh, I don't have any train stations up in my district, so right. I was just wanting to know if we could have somehow it equally distributed across sure. the county. Commissioner Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. And um, since we did have one of our residents bring us these pictures, and this is um, from what I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure, but I think this is one of the martyr station restrooms. Did you see these pictures? I, I haven't seen them, so I, w would you mind if I? Take a no, quick look. absolutely. Um, can you, you please provide this to Mr. Greenwood? Thank you. Um, so, you know, we want to address those um, issues that are brought to us by our residents, and that is one of them. And I noticed that uh, in your presentation, you do have on page six um, a page that says it shows an East Point smart restroom. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. So that we don't have these types of issues like the uh, picture that was presented by one of our residents, is there some kind of check or balance um, for the restrooms uh, to ensure that they are remaining clean for the residents? Sure. So thank you. I mean, in looking at that photograph, there's, you know, the folks in this room didn't really get a chance to see it. One was a backed up toilet, one was um, something on the floor next to the drain, and another one was um, six or seven pieces of paper littered on the floor. So just for, in a way of explaining what I just saw in the, in the image for those online and those in the room. Mm -hmm. um, all of that to say, it, I, I will never ever stand here and try to um, downplay the experience of anyone that's walked into a restroom that they don't feel is suitable for them. I, I, I will always support that person's perspective. Um, I will also say that every one of those scenes um, can be cleaned on one day and then can be messed up again on the next day. That's the, that's the nature of this dynamic use. It's, um, anyway, so, so, so these pictures that I'm showing you are the smart restrooms. The photos that we just saw are restrooms that are not the smart restrooms. Okay. So what a lot of transit agencies do and did, especially during the pandemic when we didn't have the staff to continue to maintain and keep those clean, is they closed them. Um, uh, and many transit agencies will rely on restrooms only at the Nexus station, in our case, a five points, or the end terminals. And then all the stations in between, there, there are no restrooms. So MARTA doesn't take that approach. MARTA would like to have a restroom every station, but we can't afford to have staff there all the time to continually clean up. So the, re the, the resulting response to that is these smart restrooms. So these smart restrooms is, is the answer that you're, you're asking me about, Commissioner Hall. Um, these will allow us to keep this, the restroom monitored in terms of movement. If someone's in there, we'll know. They'll will, uh, allow us to give access to the individual. It'll allow us to keep camera monitors outside of the restroom so we know if someone's going in or coming out. Um, it'll also allow us to electronically monitor the levels of paper and, and soap and products that need to be replenished. So all of this allows us to open all the stations, so we'll have a restroom in every station at the same time, not expose it to the, the you know, being susceptible to being messed up the way that one is. Okay, and so with the older restrooms, what is in place to ensure that is it just regular maintenance? 
to ensure that they stay clean? It's regular maintenance. It yeah. is regular and, maintenance. And so that's, that, is, that is what we do. And um, I, again, with a, with a washroom, um, it, it really depends on user habits as much as cleaning habits. So it is a, it is a, it is a partnership to keep these spaces suitable. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. To keep these spaces suitable. And yeah, I mean, in the one case, what I'm seeing here is a, is a toilet that needs to be flushed. Yeah. And so um, if, we, if we were to wait for the, the station services cleaner to return on their shift to do that, then that'll be the condition. Or we could just flush it. All right, thank you. And I, um, I was glad to hear you speak about um, the need for housing solutions um, for those who are displaced and homeless um, so that they are not um, utilizing or feeling the need to utilize the MARTA transit system um, as they're covering. And is there any movement on what direction you're taking to maybe collaborate? And because um, the county has a homelessness division, the city has one. Um, we have many nonprofits that we fund that are, are partners of ours that address those issues. Is there any type of collaboration or connectivity point where we can work together to ensure that we are addressing those needs? Yes, yes there are. So MARTA does work with a number of agencies that are involved with um, homelessness. As I said, Hope Atlanta is the chief among them. Uh, we're also um, looking at um, affordable housing uh, task forces such as the mayor's affordable housing strike, strike force. And, uh, and I think it, it's going to take the collective will of all of those agencies, ourselves included, to solve this. But, but to answer your question, Marta is very much invested in that conversation. Great, thank you. And lastly, um, there was a report that I've been waiting for um, to see and that was supposed to be provided to the city of Atlanta. I think there was some request for some, uh, maybe like, I think it might have been like a budget report of some kind. And is there, um, can you tell me when that would be provided or is it going to be provided? Sure, so the two things that, that you may be referring to. One is the HDR modeling tool. So that was uh, for the city of Atlanta, more MARTA program. It was uh, our ability to work with HDR, which is a, an international firm. That work has been done now. We've walked the mayor and his staff through it um, and it allows us to very quickly assess um, the feasibility of the program throughout the, you know, th through the, through the next 10, 20, 30 years, however long we want to project it. So that is one exercise that's been completed and we've sat with the mayor's CFO and, and staff to make sure that they fully understand and accept that. The other um, product that you may be referring to is a, a financial audit that, that some city of Atlanta commissioners have asked for on the Mormarta program. So that is, the terms of that audit are being worked out. We've sat our MARTA has sat with some of the mayor's staff again to talk about the parameters and the timelines and all of that. So, you know, we don't yet know when that will be concluded, but the, the, the initial conversations have started. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for this. Um, it looks great, and I ju just want to commend you on the responsiveness of you and your team whenever any of the residents in my district have raised concerns. They've always been addressed in a very swift in an uh, efficient manner, so thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Arrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, sir, how are you? Good morning, sir, fine, thanks. Uh, I wanna ask about um, what are the plans for bus service at County Line and Niskey Lake Road? Right. Um, I live at County Line and Niskey Lake Road. And right now, the option is you gotta walk over two miles to get there, to, to the closest bus stop. Okay. Right now, I have a cast on. Mm -hmm. No, I, I saw you, yeah. So if I had, I couldn't have caught the, the bus here this morning, yeah. cause I would've had to walk two miles with this knee scooter. Yeah. So what are the plans for providing service to the residents at County Line and Niskey Lake Road? 
Thank you for the question, Commissioner Arrington. Um, let me let me back up and then get very quickly to the to the answer. So, for those that don't know, uh, there's a two mile loop on Niski Lake Road that we received several complaints that it was unsafe because the width of the bus was such that oncoming traffic felt that they were being forced off the road. No sidewalks and whatnot in some locations and just just very difficult for them. We, we had enough of those complaints. We looked at the, the statistics and found that we had a couple of collisions and near collisions in the last year. And so we sent our safety and ops team out there to formally assess it. They came back with the recommendation that we should not be operating 40 or even 30 foot buses on that road because it is it is unsafe. There's just not enough room and we're we're designing in a head on collision, which is not something we wanted to do. So MARTA went ahead and pulled the buses off of that road, but consistent with that, we engaged MARTA Connect, which is a program where we put door hangers on every door along the Ski Lake Road. So um, anyway, what it means is that someone who now lives on Niski Lake Road and wants connection with the system, they just use Uber or Lyft and MARTA will pay for it, two trips a day, and that's been in place since the buses came off. Long-term solution, we've asked the, uh, the mayor's staff, uh, the commissioner, DOT, DOT commissioner, to come up with physical improvements on Niski Lake so that we can pull the buses back on there. So I, I fully appreciate that that kind of civil work takes time and we trust that they're moving that forward, but in the meantime, MARTA Connects continues to be a service to you. What, what about MARTA vans or the paratransit buses? Can, could those be used? I mean, how, how long have these routes been running? Well, so, we've been paying in the MARTA for yeah. 40, 50, 60 years yeah, now, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and how long have these routes been running for them to now be a determination after 30, 40 years you, you, you that asked, the routes are unsafe? You're asking the very question I asked. When I, when I heard about this, I said, you're, you're kidding me. How long has this been a route that we're just figuring this out now? But here are two things that came to my mind. One is um, when the route was initially established, uh, the sidewalks in the areas that they're in weren't there. So there has been some civil construction, wasn't vetted with MARTA. We, so our drivers just continue to do the best they can in a tough situation. Not fair to put the drivers in that, in that boat. The second thing that came to mind is it's never a good question to say, well, or, or position to say, well, we've always done it this way, so we're just going to continue doing it. When someone puts in front of me in my desk a, a legitimate safety concern and one that's vetted through the safety department, I, I would love the luxury of being able to say, well, we've always been doing it, I'm going to keep doing it, but I just couldn't, I couldn't do that. Okay, so how many how many accidents with MARTA buses have there been on that route? We're aware of in the past year there were two that were reported, but I'm not just concerned about an accident. I'm concerned about the near miss or the evasive action that POV drivers take to avoid the accident. All right. Well, uh, I, w I would hope that you all would look at uh, reestablishing the service and using smaller vehicles. Um, I don't believe that, um, I heard you say y'all did it all along Niski Lake, but I'm, I'm on county line. So I guess I didn't get one. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that, I don't think that that is a good replacement or a viable option. I think it would be much better to provide a smaller unit bus, like the paratransit buses that you have uh, and continue those routes. So I would request humbly uh, that you all look into doing that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. All right, other comments or questions for Mr. Nunn? All right, thank you. Thank you all. all right. Mr. Manager, let's see. Well, it's 123. Um, let's do the operational report before we recess. Yes, sir. We'll uh, speed through this. I think it's really one subject, which is ORCA and courts. Um, one thing I want to bring to your attention, the BRU did report that the special election went off uh, well, everything opened on time, no issues to report. What you'll see in our operations uh, overview this morning is ORCA cases within 400 now of having dismissed or disposed of 100,000 cases, so a milestone coming up. We are seeing some slight improvements in pace. and. Uh, Mr. Adams will highlight uh, that as well as some new charts that uh, detail jail population, unindicted cases, and average length of stay. Um, average, the uh, 
uh, emergency purchase orders approved by you, requested by the sheriff, are moving forward. So that, uh, that's good news. You'll also see in today's agenda the CSP program will be presented $6.8 million in support for community organizations and, of course, the community directly, as well as a million for uh, veterans organizations, $500,000 for uh, summer youth, as well as 500,000 for Wellspring. So again, a, a great uh, day in terms of uh, all of those initiatives approved by this board. We will review the ARPA numbers today, but there are really no changes. The changes that we propose, we're gonna present at the uh, May 22nd uh, retreat. Because we've looked through all of the ARPA numbers, things that we think we will underrun that could be reallocated, as well as the two uh, reserves for facilities and uh, healthcare that uh, you put in place in the budget. So we'll propose, again, uses of those for the near term and then seek your guidance. Um, speaking of the retreat, we've worked hard to finish that agenda. You should have it now. It's been published uh, for the public as well. And the materials also you should have uh, available. So most of that meeting will be spent on the long-term financials, the major cost drivers and the alternative revenue sources. But we do plan to cover in that meeting employee compensation and public relations as two cross-cutting issues. So much to be teed up, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, over the next uh, week or so. And we thank you for your consideration and we'll move through this report turning to uh, Mr. Adams and seeing if there are any questions on any of the other uh, items in this report. Mr. Adams, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Pitts, uh, Vice Chair Ellis, Commissioners. Uh, per uh, the county manager's uh, comments, I will take you through this at a high level and obviously always open to questions as we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to date, we have uh, disposed of uh, 99,690 uh, cases. Uh, that compares to the 148,000 cases that we started with. That leaves us 48,518 cases uh, remaining that are remaining to be disposed of between now and October of 2024. Uh, the next slide uh, gives you a sense of the uh, pace of the disposition over the last couple of months. Uh, we did pick up a bit in the last month or so, um, and I will go into the, to a little detail on, on where that, uh, that pick came from. But, but overall, uh, we're tracking about, uh, disposing at about 3,000 cases a month, which, uh, which at this particular pace will allow us to dispose of uh, the majority of the cases that we targeted uh, by, uh, by next year. I do want to point out, however, that as these cases move from our prosecutors to state and superior court, particularly in superior court as they move to trials, we are in fact going to see a bit of a slowdown given the nature of the cases and how long it takes to get through those trials. But, but overall, uh, we continue to make uh, great progress in the overall caseload. Next slide. Uh, talk specifically to uh, some of the data that we look at on a monthly basis and project to date. Uh, what you will see is that um, we had a, um, uh, in terms of the, of the variance versus the target for the month of April, uh, good performance versus the target, uh, a large percentage of that, in fact, the bulk of that was in the Solicitor General's office. Um, the Solicitor General focused specifically on a range of diversion programs that allowed them to, in fact, uh, settle a number of cases. And uh, that's something that they had been working on for quite some time. And we saw that uh, really come to a um, uh, really peak in the month of, of April. So big impact there. Overall, I think overall, if you look at the other agencies, they kind of balanced out to, uh, to, to, to where, what we were targeting. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, what you see is that we continue to exceed the, uh, the target that we had uh, that we had outlined, so we have a bit of a buffer, which we are likely going to need as we move into the next uh, year and a half or so. Uh, the next slide, or the next two slides, just give you a sense of some of the information we look at. Um, the gray line basically gives you a sense for the target for the various agencies. The orange line talks to the resources that are in fact deployed. We, we need to make sure that we in fact are providing the resources needed to move the caseload and the uh, blue line just gives you a sense for the dispositions. We look at this over, uh, in this particular case, over the last year or so. Um, no real uh, you know, commentary here, just to give you a sense for the type of information we're tracking. And quite frankly, the type of information that we give to our various agencies, so they have a sense 
as to how well they are tracking versus the target. Page 77 just gives you a sense for the various, uh, the various courts as well. I think the one comment I would make is that our, our prosecutors have, uh, have really picked up the pace in terms of dispositions. Those cases will, in fact, then move. A large number of those cases will then, in fact, move to state court and to, uh, to superior court. The next slide is an update on our, next slide please. This slide gives you an update on our hiring. Um, for the most part, I'd say that uh, you know, we continue to, to add at a, at a relatively um, uh, you know, kind of small clip, but, but it is positive in terms of the additions. And uh, in some cases, we, we, we continue to have uh, some gaps in terms of, of filling the roles. That kind of reflects, it's really a microcosm of what we're seeing across the county in, in non-ORCA positions. Um, but uh, you, what we're, saying, we're showing you here is where we've made some incremental progress since, uh, since the last report. Next slide. Uh, in terms of uh, things that we continue to track, we also are looking at, uh, next slide please, at overall court capacity and performance, uh, including uh, non-ORCA cases. So this particular slide gives you a sense for and let me step back and explain it. We looked at the pace of each one of these various agencies in the months preceding the uh, pre preceding COVID. So basically, if you look at February, that's an average number. We looked at the average number of February for February uh, 2018 and February 2019, and and uh, and, and and therefore that set a benchmark for what we are comparing our current throughput uh, to uh, for these various agencies. So therefore, take away on that. If you look at Superior Court, for example, what we're finding is that we are tracking fairly well to the pace that we were tracking pre-COVID uh, in civil cases. We are still ramping up in criminal cases, as you would expect, uh, because jury trials and the like are still ramping up. We also have the same issue uh, or, or, or same numbers in, in state court, uh, continue to, to, to ramp up in, in criminal cases, doing very well in the civil cases. And as I mentioned, what we're finding is that the, the, the DA, the district attorney, and the solicitor, uh, in part due to the uh, additional resources that have been uh, injected into those particular areas, have in fact been able to get back to the pace that they were at overall uh, uh, pre-COVID over the last three months or so. Next slide. In terms of the jail population, uh, what we are seeing is that we continue to be uh, at or about uh, you know, 3,600, give or take, uh, which, is, which, is, uh, which means we're not making progress in terms of getting people out faster than we're bringing them in. And uh, hence, why the big focus is on a number of things that we can do in the system to try to, uh, to reverse that particular, particular trend. This just gives you a breakdown of how individuals are dispersed across the various facilities. So as you can see, um, we have uh, individuals in, in, you know, 50 individuals in Alpharetta. Our, our number for loan outs is primarily uh, the uh, Cobb Jail. Uh, and then we have a uh, breakdown of, of, uh, of, of individuals that we have at our uh, main jail at Rice Street. Next slide, please. One of the things that uh, we've had discussions about and there have been questions about is, you know, what's the profile of individuals that are in the current, uh, in, 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 the, in the system today? And uh, th there's been a lot of discussion about indicted versus unindicted. Um, this just gives you a quick breakdown. There's something here, again, that we look at on a regular basis of individuals who are unindicted in the jail. Um, and, and we try to break it down between individuals who are there, uh, both uh, who may have other charges and, and individuals who are unindicted with a, uh, with a hold. And so uh, in talking to uh, Madam DA last week, she is comfortable with these numbers. She understands them. And she did indicate that uh, she would like to have, which we delivered, a list of all the individuals, those 1277. And she committed to working those cases. And she believes that we can, in fact, she, she, her office can indict those individuals the next, within the next four to six months. So a lot of focus and priority on those individuals, because that, in some ways, that begins the, uh, the process. The next slide 
just gives you a sense of the makeup of individuals in a jail. And one of the things that, that uh, our, our jail infrastructure is challenged with, as well as the court system, is the change in the demographics of the individuals who are in the Fulton County Jail. In 2018, 42 percent of the individuals in the jail were charged with serious violent felony charges, and the definitions are down at the bottom of the page. That number is 58 percent. And so you say, well, why, is this, why do we care? Why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant for a couple of reasons. One, uh, those trials tend to take longer, tend to be a bit more complex, and as a result has an implication for ability to move them through the system. Secondly, the makeup of the population also has implications for classification at the jail, and it also has implications for the safety of individuals at the jail, both the, uh, the inmate population as well as our deputies at a time where we are severely understaffed. So it is, it is something that, uh, that is important, and it's something that we track, and it is something that has, I think, significant implications for a number of the issues that we're trying to address as we move cases through the system. To that end, the next slide gives you a sense for the average length of stay of individuals in the Fulton County Jail. In 2018, the average length of stay was 33 days. Today, uh, the average length of stay, I, know I shouldn't say today, but in 2022, that number had grown to almost 60 days. Here again, the implications are that that is one of the feeds, an important feed, into the overpopulation in the system. It's one of the things that as we think about a leading indicator of what in fact will allow us to reduce the jail population, that average length of stay and be able to move that number, and in fact, is one of the things that allows us to in fact get people out of the system, uh, system faster. The next slide. Uh, gives you a sense for some of the things that we are working on in conjunction with state court, superior court, the public defender, the district attorney, the sheriff, and the, and, and the DA to find ways to, in fact, focus on moving individuals through the system and getting people out of the Fulton County Jail. I will not go into detail on all of these. There are a couple I'd like to point out, though. One is we've increased the number of senior judges for superior court that will, in fact, allow us to hear more criminal cases and will allow us to, in fact, see if we can move more criminal cases through the system. The other one I would like to call out, and it's actually was something that was mentioned in the AJC last week, is that state court has agreed to take on civil cases from the superior court calendar. That will allow the superior court judges to then focus on criminal cases and, in fact, ideally move some of those criminal cases through the system. I um, want to thank state court, quite frankly, for agreeing to do it. Their judges agreed to do it. And superior court, most of their judges are going to be, it's not going to be all of the civil cases, but it's going to be the ones that could potentially be handed over in the short term. We think that that's probably one of the biggest levers we have in terms of increasing the throughput through the uh, superior court system. And then finally, there's been a lot of press about, uh, about, about what we, the, the, the C3 conflict attorneys and the ability to basically handle multi-defendant cases. Um, we have uh, the, the Superior Court um, led by, uh, uh, by David Summerlin and his team and, 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 and Judge McBurney have put together a C3 program. They have, in fact, engaged 30, 20 different attorneys. Uh, they're dealing with 80 different cases. We think that this is going to help us as we deal with some of these multi-defendant cases, which, 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 which create a particularly high level of stress on the system across the board. Next slide, please. And so I'd like to, to close really by saying that, that we are focused on and laser focused on three things. One, eliminating the backlog, continuing to focus on the backlog. Two, getting the system back to where we were pre-COVID because that is really important. And then finally, working on numerous ways to reduce the jail population because of the implications across the board that we have talked about. Been, the next slide, just as a point of information for, for individuals who are, uh, who, are, who are interested in finding more data, uh, this just gives you a list of the information that is provided on 
the Fulton County uh, website. It, it, it has a lot of data, and it really feeds into the level of transfer, transparency we think is really, really important, certainly for Fulton County. We have looked at other counties around the country, because we like the benchmark. We haven't found one yet that has a level of detail with the cadence that the Fulton County system has when it comes to tracking and reporting on our system. If someone does find one, let us know, because we always like to emulate best practices. But at this point in time, we consider ourselves to be one of the most transparent systems when it comes to tracking the performance of the county justice system. Thanks for your time. Happy to take any questions. All right, uh, uh, Vice Chair Ellis. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll try to pace through this real quick. Um, thanks, Mr. Adam, for the, you know, for all the slides on it. I do continue to think we need, you know, we have a lot of data points. I think we need sort of like four or five headlines that we can kind of really look at up front, because uh, sometimes sort of too much, too much data kind of gets you the point of, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily know what you're looking at. Uh, but on a um, few, few comments and just questions on six and seven, uh, where you go through the dispositions, the one category that sort of slowed considerably is in this magistrate. Buck, are these mostly civil? These are civil cases, right? Uh, you, you, the, you mean the backlog in the, in the magistrate yeah. cases? I would yeah. say primarily, yeah, but not totally. What's that? I said it's probably a combination of both in terms of the backlog and magistrate. That's correct. But mostly civil. That's correct. Okay. Any idea why that just fell to basically, you know, no activity in April? I mean, the resources are the same. The, you know, the, the, I, I, think, I think magistrate, short, magistrate court um, continues to try to, how would I describe it, um, get, get its footing in terms of how it uses the ORCA resources. Uh, they have been a bit uh, understaffed. Some of those resources are new. And, um, and, and I think in terms of adopting e-filing, probably not as aggressive as we should be. I do know that a number of the judges are, um, are using the virtual system. But, uh, but for the most part, I think it's, it, it, it's probably more about execution and, and priority at this point in time. OK. Page 12, um, just so I'm clear on page 12, this is sort of got these slides. I mean, I think I got what you said. It's a little bit hard to follow, um, but these are post-COVID cases disposition. Is this what we're trying to look at and compare it to the rate of dispositions in pre-COVID? That, that is correct. So if you, if, you, if you looked at the February number, for example, for Superior Court, and you said, well, what's the target? That target would be an average of what February dispositions were in 2000, uh, 2018 and 2019. So, uh, we're, to so the, we're disposing of the, at a rate of 68 percent. Like, all right, so in April, this is the top line. We're disposing of 72 percent of the cases comparatively to what we would have been disposing of in 2018 and 2019? Is that what that, that's correct? The average of 2018 okay. and 2019. So we're about with 72 percent of the pace that we were operating at for the for, for, for April of 2018 and 2019 okay. average. Okay. I mean, I guess the one thing that I understand the notion that criminal cases may take longer, but when you look at this, it, it, it gives the impression that there's not there's more focus being applied to civil cases because maybe they might be easier to address and we're not leaning in, in enough to the criminal cases in fostering a further backlog i mean if we're already at exceeding the numbers in the civil cases but we're still you know 30 30 35 percent below with the criminal cases yeah and i i think part of it uh, as well uh, I mean, I'm just, making sure, a I'm just making a statement. I'm not asking you for actually it. Okay. explain it. I'm just making a statement. Okay. Um, and if we had, if we heard anything from our superior court that they do not have enough space for courtrooms to handle criminal cases, is that an issue? They, they, they are. They would like to have more space. That's how correct. Much, how many? How much more space? Um, well, they've, they've identified a couple of courtrooms that 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 they that they use. Uh, one or two days a week that they, they'd like to be able to have access for five days, five days. Um, and 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 quite frankly you know at the beginning of 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 orca we had an anticipated that we might be able to have 
uh, criminal cases outside of the courthouse. But for security reasons and other reasons, we haven't been able to do that. So we've got a couple of courtrooms outside that we use primarily for civil cases uh, outside of the courthouse. Uh, but, 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 but courtroom space is at a premium. We've refurbished a couple of them. But if we had our druthers, we'd probably reorient a couple of others away from kind of civil activities towards, the, towards criminal, criminal cases. So they and, we're, want, and we're working so on that. they want more for, they, they need some more space for criminal cases. That is correct. We potentially have some that we can move to We're, we're trying to work that issue right now. There are a couple that have been identified that we think might trying be able to Trying to work? To I mean, what's necessarily to make it work? I mean, what's the... We need to. Do we need to say. I mean, we need to say. Hey, make this a priority, right? You know. I mean, it's if it's there, it's obviously an issue. It's impacting everybody. I mean, what do we need to get it over? It, the it is a priority. Uh, we we do have elected officials that require us to to negotiate it a bit. Um, and so, but yes, it is. It is. It is a priority. Are they own the courtrooms. Uh, they do not. Okay. All right. Enough said. Um, page fourteen. Uh, and I hope we can get some attention to that. And if, you know, if this board needs to provide some direction to give somebody, to, hey, open up and use the facilities for what's a priority, then, you know, I mean, this makes sense. I think we should give you that direction. I mean, it's um, page 14. This is good. I do still think graphically it's sort of hard to get your head around sometimes, and it's hard to see these smaller spaces. Um, it might be useful just to show number versus and the capacity for each facility instead of putting it in a bar graph just put it in a numerical chart okay um because you just can't really i don't acd some of the in some of these the coloring and all that sort of stuff you can kind of sometimes you're not sure necessarily what you're looking at but like acdc for example we have access to 750 beds that is correct and we're using 413, is that, or are uh, we using 338? Think, Which one is that? Uh, my understanding is we're up to 400 uh, at ACDC, so, 413. So they're 14. Right. So anyway, just maybe there's just a different way to present that. Um, and then we don't show the Union City facility, which we own, that has, what, 300 and something beds, 400 beds, 500 beds? We don't show it because we, it's, still, it's still closed. Uh, we're in the process of, uh, the sheriff is in the process of, um, evaluating when and how to reopen it. Uh, okay. But once, once we move individuals there, we, that will show up in this chart as well. Okay. Page 15, just uh, you said, please hear your remarks on that. You said that the notion is to try to get these unindicted cases cleared out within the next four months. Th that is correct. When I met with um, DA Willis last week, she asked specifically to get a list to her of these 12, this 1,277, which was done I believe on Friday, the clerk uh, provided that information, and um, and she indicated that she thought it would take uh, four months, uh, that she would spend the next four months um, indicting those particular cases. Okay, thank you. All right, any, uh, Commissioner Arrington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to go back to page 12. Page 12? Yes, I'm a little confused as well as far as dispose and percentage capacity, can you just put the 2018 numbers on there so we can see them ourselves? I will do that, Commissioner. We'll add that to the uh, to the next slide. We'll do that. Yeah, I mean, like, I, you know, I don't understand all that, but I can look at the 2018 numbers and compare them to the 2023 numbers myself yeah. Yeah. without some type of percentage capacity. And, we can uh, certainly do that. Number of cases disposed, I mean, you know, just let me see the numbers. I, I can just make the determination from there. Because um, I think that definitely is confusing. Um, but it sounds like we're moving in the right direction. Um, you know, and certainly whatever we can do to speed it up. Now, as far as these additional courts, additional space, the, uh, Commissioner Ellis was inquiring about, are there additional judges to put in those additional spaces? Yeah, with the, with the, uh, we have, with the hiring of the four additional um, uh, senior oh. judges, right. um, we, they, they would be able to utilize the, uh, the space to move some of the, the criminal cases. That's, that's correct. Okay, wait, with the hiring 
the senior the senior judges that we added. Okay. Yeah, the part you know they they, they uh, yeah. That completes my report, unless there are any additional questions. All right, anything else for Mr. Adams? Mr. Manager? Uh, yes, sir. We did not intend to go through anything else because, again, the ARPA information we'll share at the uh, retreat and the uh, financials that have been provided for you through April are I think pretty self-explanatory and represent no issues in terms of uh, this year's financials. So unless there are any questions, we are concluding in our report. All right. Any questions? All right. No questions. Uh, colleagues, it's 150. I'll entertain a motion to recess for lunch, real estate, litigation, and our, uh, what's the other one? Oh, we get it. The other one. Yes. Personnel. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Let's vote, please. When the vote is open. And the motion passes, four yeas, zero nays.
Your crowd ready? ready. All right. Objection. We will resume the regular order of business. Madam Clerk, please proceed. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Do we have items from executive session? She's not here. All right. She's not here. She's signing some documents. Let's okay. go to the next. Bottom of page six, 230339, finance review and approval of May 17th budget sounding. Anything, Madam CFO? Anything to add? Uh, no, sir. Most of the items on here were additions to the AML listing. Um, no budgetary impact, just additional spending authority. All right. Uh, motion to approve by Vice Chair Ellis, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Page seven, 230341. Human Resources Management requests approval of updates to the Equal Employment Opportunity and Prudential Act Policy, Prudential right. Act Favorable policy. motion by Commissioner Hall, seconded by Commissioner Abdul Rockman. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 23-0342. Real Estate and Asset Management requests approval to provide a letter of support for inclusion with the City of Atlanta's Federal Highway Administrative Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Grant application. And motion to approve by Vice Chair Ellis, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Thorne. Is there anybody who can speak on this? Or not here? Um, I don't see Joe, who would probably be most um, readily available to answer any questions. Okay. Is he here? There he is. Where is he? Where? Oh. Come on, sir. Let's go. Morning, Commissioners. <laughs> Good afternoon, Robert. I'm sorry. All right. All right, an explanation of 0342, the uh, letter of support for the City of Atlanta's Federal Highway Administration. The City of Atlanta reached out to us a little while ago. They were in the process of applying for a grant that would allow for the installation of EV charging stations. The primary goal of the grant was to allow you to partner with another entity that would provide up to 20% of the funding. The city of Atlanta was able to reach out to BP Pulse, a subsidiary of British Petroleum, that does not currently do business in America, but they're gonna finance part of that. They wanted to know, would Fulton County be willing to offer a letter of support to go in with their grant application to have a better chance of getting it with the promise of, if we receive the funds, we want to install EV charging stations at Fulton County libraries mm -hmm. that are within the city limits of Atlanta. That's it. Uh, so these EV charging stations, once they're installed, is what's the maintenance or the cost of running them? Um, will we be charging for use of these stations? That so type of thing. on our end, this is going to be a program very similar to one that we're also trying to establish simultaneously in which the charging company will enter or into a use or right of access agreement. They will be responsible financially for all the infrastructure that needs to be installed in order to facilitate the uh, implementation of the program. But they are going to be accessible by the public, 
but it is going to be at a fee to the public, just like you would at any other charging farm that you may find at a Kroger or Publix or whatever the case may be. It's just that now you're giving citizens access in the areas in which they live, near the, at the libraries. Okay, great, that's all I have. All right, the motion on the floor is to approve. Let's vote, please. In vote, it's open. And motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 230343, request approval to utilize corporate purchasing contract in the amount not to exceed $1,392,282.89 to provide demolition and removal of eight existing rooftop units. All right, motion to approve by Vice Chair Ellis, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 230344, request approval to increase spending authority for furniture and installation services for the Fulton County Central Warehouse in the total amount of $351,522.81. Motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Under arts and culture, 230345, Request approval, request for the rescission of the approval of a public art contract with David Moore and Adam Dick. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Barrett, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. And the vote is open. And motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. On page eight, 230346, request approval of a public art contract to commission Alan Peterson to create three site-specific original works of art. Motion to approve by Commissioner Barrett, seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Under Health and Human Services, 230347, Public Works, request approval of the dedication of a permanent con construction easement to Johns Creek for the purpose of constructing the old Alabama Road Trail. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 230348, request approval of a recommended proposal in an amount not to exceed 117,105 to provide a laboratory information management system. Motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne. It's seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 230349, request approval of the lowest responsible bidder in, in an amount not to exceed $550,000 to provide sewer system cleaning and manhole camera inspection. All right, service. favorable motion by Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 230350, Community Development. Request approval of the 2023 Community Service Program Evaluation Committee's recommendations in the amount of $6,863,958. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne and seconded by Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Hall, you have the floor. Is anyone here who can answer? Well, Dr. Rochelle? I will. Yes, <laughs> okay. ma'am. Um, I was just looking at the ineligibility list and um, just looking at um, what disqualified people, or should I say disqualified nonprofit organizations, um, and wanted to know are we providing technical services to those nonprofit organizations that may be small and new or, you know, need that technical service? I, I recall um, that this was a big issue raised back when I was chief of staff to John Garner and Mike Rowicki was um, one of the employees that worked on the um, grant project. And we set up a whole technical services piece to address those needs. Can you, can you respond to that? Uh, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Hall, 
we do have the opportunity for technical assistance at the top of every funding application opportunity with the advent of more constituents being comfortable with Zoom. We provide that through a virtual oh, platform. And great. so there are multiple opportunities before the application is due to receive that technical assistance. And during that technical assistance, applicants can ask a host of questions. So is that separate from the workshops that are offered before the application process? Or is that? That's a part of the application process. Okay, well there are a lot of nonprofits who have complained to me that they miss the workshops because they don't even find out about the grant opportunity until the workshops have been long gone. So is there uh, a way to offer technical assistance uh, or I don't know, um, figure out where the disconnect is and connecting with the community of nonprofit organizations, especially those that are new to finding out about this opportunity. I thank you for that feedback, Commissioner Hall. What I will ask the department to do is to host a series of workshops, for example, so you want to do business with Fulton County That's and it. have contract information perhaps invite our purchasing department to be a part of that. I understand your concern now that you want constituents or organizations to have an opportunity to understand how we do business and how they can prepare for that well ahead of the funding opportunity. Yes, so we'll, that's awesome. we'll make that happen. That is an awesome idea. I know Felicia Strong Whitaker and her team have always done that on the business side, but that is very uh, good to offer it on the nonprofit side as well because it does go out as an RFP, right? Yes, ma'am. And and that has been difficult to explain to the nonprofit organizations why it goes out as an RFP. And they said, well, we're, this is a grant. We're not bidding. And so just that explanation alone helps. Thank we'll, you. We'll make that happen. Thank you both. All right, the motion on the floor is to approve. Please vote. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. On page nine, 230351, request approval of the 2023 Veterans Services Program Evaluation Committee's recommendation in the amount of $1 million. All right, motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne is seconded by Commissioner Hall. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 230352. Request approval of the 2023 Summer Youth Job Training Program Evaluation Committee recommendation in the amount of $500,000. All right, a favorable motion by Commissioner Barrett, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Cast your vote, please. The vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. 230353, request approval of a contract between Fulton County and Well Springs Living in the amount of $500,000 funds for construction purposes. All right, we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Thorne, seconded by Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Ellis, may I ask you, when we, didn't we say that uh, we specified that the money had to be used for construction, is that right? And we had some discussion about it. And that's what this does, but well, not for general purposes. Okay, motion to approve, please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, six yeas, zero nays. Under Justice and Safety, 230354, Solicitor General, request approval of a resolution to retain any program fees collected in the administration of the solicitor's pretrial intervention and diversion program. I have a motion on the floor to approve by Commissioner Thorne and seconded by Commissioner Hall. Vice Chair, you have the floor. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in support of this, but I just wanted to make sure before we passed it um, that that what we were doing there fit with you know accounting standards and it wasn't something we needed to sort of confirm before we put it in place. Pastor Ellis, we do have a, um, a question about whether or not it would comply with GASB standards regarding transfer of general fund revenue um, into a special revenue fund. So we have actually um, asked the external auditors to take a look at that. We have not heard back from them yet, but there is a concern about um, if, if approved, whether or not we could effectuate this from an accounting standards perspective. 
How long do you think we'd, before we would hear back? I, I hope to hear back um, within the next week. Could we approve it subject to that condition? I think that would be fine. Okay. All right, that, uh, with that condition attached to it, but I do have a, uh, another question. How many other departments, I know there are several others where we allow them to, well, they raise funds and, it, and we've agreed in the past that they, the, the money goes to their department and not to the general fund. Do you recall how many there are and which ones? The two that come most readily to mind were um, new fees that the clerk of court initiated um, that are going into a court technology fund. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll have to go back and double check, but in, in that case, I don't recall that those fees were statutorily required to go to the general fund. Um, and in this case, the, the language um, in the statute does indicate that they should be paid over to the general fund, which is what has caused this issue uh, to need to be looked at. Yeah, I mean, I understand the concept here, but we, I think we need to be consistent. Mr. Yeah, I think super, uh, superior court. Let's don't guess now. I need to know what is it. I want us to be consistent if we're going to do this from, the, from department to department where applicable. Chairman Pitts, I, I, to be honest with you, I would need to go back and take a look at all the special revenue funds. Um, off the top of my head, the technology funds are the ones that came to mind. Um, there are other special revenue funds, but I believe that uh, most, if not all of those, are guided by the statute as to how the revenues are to be held. Um, but I would need to go back. I would feel more comfortable going back and taking a look at it. The law library is another one that comes to mind um, where fees may be um, uh, going into a fund that is specific to the law library, law library, um, a portion of which may have been done by statute and a portion of which may have been done by the Board of uh, Commissioners. So I would need to take a look at that. Okay, I would think, uh, colleagues, that it would be important for us to, have, to look for consistency if we're going to do this. That's number one. Number two, the second part of this, I don't recall having seen this, where the statement here is that the solicitor's budget, or it could be, put anybody's name in there, is not reduced by any program fees collected pursuant to said program. I haven't seen that before. Uh, that would simply mean that we would I know what it means, but I said I haven't seen it before. Um, I, again, I would have to go back and look at the, the resolutions that have been approved and the language within those resolutions um, to see if they had similar language. The law library is one that comes to mind that may have some similar language to that effect. All right, well, I'd like for us to, to, you know, to, if you could do that quickly at our next meeting to answer those two questions. I mean, the concept is fine, but consistency and, and, and not reducing the department's budget by that, it may be necessary to reduce the department's budget. And here, I'm not sure what we're talking about, whether it's 15,000 or 100,000. Anyway, I'm gonna make a substitute motion to hold. Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Abdul Rockman, you have the floor. Yes, Chairman. Um, I, I'll support it to hold it, but I just want to be on record saying, you know, I, I understand your concern, and I had the opportunity to speak with Solicitor Gamage because that was my concern, it, it, the same, but I do not want to preemptively not support any of us, and that includes the solicitor when we're talking about a small amount. And so I, I, I just want to put that I will uh, actually support it so we get the information back. But I think if we have conversations and find out that we're talking about twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, then are we really trying to be impactful? Or are we trying to keep people from doing what they need to do? So I just want to be on record saying that I will support the whole, but I, I, I do say that we be fair across the board, but we also look at the dollar amount as well, please, Chairman. All right, substitute motion on the floor. Substitute motion on the floor is to hold. If you could have that at our next meeting, I'd appreciate it. Let's vote on the motion to hold. Substitute motion to hold. And the vote is open on the motion to hold. Why are we holding? To 
answer those two questions. Number one, the consistency with the other programs that we funded like this. And then the second part is why uh, the language here, uh, not reducing uh, the budget, could be any department by any, f any fees collected. Well, do we, I asked the, can you come up for a second? Because I, I just have to ask this question because consistent with the fees that other departments are doing, what are the fees? It's a sliding scale between zero for our indigent participants, and we've topped our program out at $250. From zero to 250 so it's a sliding scale based on what? Based on the factors related to whether or not the defendant is indigent, and then their ability to pay, and then the other important circumstances surrounding the evidence, the need for the type of program that that individual would need to be diverted to, and what the administrative burden, quite frankly, is associated with it. We did also, and thank you, Madam Commissioner and Commissioners and Mr. Chair, we did, you know, I am a lawyer, prosecutors are lawyers, and we did, uh, like any lawyer would, examine those issues. And we believe, as does Steve Rosenberg, a lawyer who came over to my office from the county attorney's office, we believe that we're on all fours with all laws, as every lawyer in particular and all servant leaders know, oftentimes laws are constructed in a way and written in a fashion where there might be a space, I won't say for conflict, but for sensible people to interpret them. So when the state legislature created the opportunity, the important need for diversion, they created a methodology to fund it through the prosecutor. And by doing so, they knew that the prosecutor shouldn't and cannot collect fees. So that statute requires us to partner with the clerk, which we've already done, for the clerk to take those fees. Because there are fees coming into the county, the other component of it is that they have to go into the general fund, but section F under the resolution that our erudite county attorney's office examined and approved provides that it should be utilized for the administrative costs of the program. Okay. So, you know, laws are made one day, other laws are made another day, years, decades later, and so it's up to enlightened, sensible people to interpret them in a way that makes sense. We've done that, we think, with a lot of lawyers looking at it and examining it, and uh, we appreciate your attention to it, and I think it's clear that we've been very dutiful in moving diversion forward, not just in Fulton County, honestly, but in our state. And um, I'd love to have you all support. I understand the, the motion and respect it. Uh, but I'd love to be able to put, push the gas, if you will, down on expanding and providing more opportunity for our citizens that need it. And every single day I met with the sheriff earlier, I know he was here. Every single day, there are people lingering in jail. And if I can start even earlier than we do now, We'll catch them before they even go to that jail. And so I'd like for you, I'd like your support, like any other questions, and I'd like to do it today if possible, respecting the motion. Well, let me say I, I, I would love to catch them before they go to jail. We have enough issues with the overcrowding of the jail as it is. So to put something in place to relieve that is absolutely what I want to support. So thank you. Is this time sensitive? The, the truth is uh, we've been making incremental changes and improvements with the help of this board, the county manager, Mr. Adams, and everyone here. And so, you know, the sooner the better. But if those questions need to be answered, then certainly we understand the need to do so. Uh, but every single day, there are people who have sons and daughters who are affected by the decisions my office makes. And it's their liberty. And although we're doing a good job, I can tell you, you know, many of you may have gotten emails from me on three, four, five in the morning. I know the county manager and Mr. Adams have. But it's because these things bother and plague my mind. And uh, I'll rest easier if we're able to resolve these critical issues earlier. Well, thank you for your restorative justice hard work. All right, anything else? The motion on the floor is to hold it for the next meeting. Let's vote, please. And the vote is open on the motion to hold. Okay. 
Motion to hold fails, two yeas, one nay. Back to the main motion to, to approve, please vote. And the vote is open. This is subject to the accounting affirmation. Yeah, subject to Gatsby, you have that by the end. If we don't get that. Yes, we'll, we'll let the board know as soon as we hear back from the external auditors. And I still like my questions answered, even though the motion. Yes, sir, we'll still provide the information. All right, motion on the floor is to approve. And the yes. motion passes, five yeas, zero nays. Next item. On page 10, 230320, request approval resolution adopting desired aspirational standards for criminal cases handled within the Fulton County Justice System, urging all elected and appointed officials serving in a Fulton Justice capacity to focus their efforts towards meeting these standards and for other purposes. All right, a favorable motion by Commissioner Hall is seconded by Commissioner Abdul Rockman. I'm sorry, Hall. I'm going to have to withdraw that because I have a, some questions. I have some letters and so I need to do that first. I'm sorry. Well, uh, Commissioner Abdul Rahman, will you withdraw your second so she can withdraw her motion? Yes. All right. Okay. You, you can withdraw. flip that right. and then I just I so. have some questions. I, um, I, for, I didn't realize. Clear I, the machine. Now. You ready? Yes. All right. So um, I realized that Judge Glanville sent us an, a letter uh, dated March, no, sorry, dated May 16th. And uh, this letter, I'm looking at it, and there are some things in here that um, he's saying, and, and the very first line just caught my eye. It says, I'm writing to you respectfully to voice objections regarding the proposed resolution to adopt measures and standards for criminal cases handled within the Fulton County justice system. And the letter goes on to explain why he says he's objecting. He says, first, the purpose resolution is not necessary as there are already checks and balances in place to ensure that criminal cases are timely processed, and he goes on to explain why he said that. And secondly, he says the proposed resolution seems to draw significant attention to the cost and outlay of funds from the county to the justice system. And he says it is worth noting, however, that specifically Superior Court and Court Administration only received less than 10% of the total amount budgeted to Fulton County. And the letter goes on to thirdly, say the purpose, the proposed resolution does not adequately capture the efficiency efforts put into effect and the continued challenges facing the justice system. And he goes on to explain that. So this is a lot of objections and explanations as to why um, state courts, um, Judge Glanville's court objects, but then there's still more um, emails from other electeds in law enforcement and the courts um, not going, not completely on board with this. So I think that when you are legislating and it is impacting the way that people do their work and uh, it's not and they're saying to you, you're going to put me in a situation that's not adequate. I think we need to stop and listen. They are the experts. And that is one thing that I'm very big on, allow the experts to have the input and allow them to do their jobs. Um, so that's, that's it, thank you. Vice Chair Ellis. Uh, I'll be I'll be real brief, Mr. Chair. So at the at the last meeting, I outlined um, you know kind of why I was bringing this for us. I'm not going to belabor that. These are just measurements. They don't force the court to do anything operationally. They separation of duties. They do their own thing. We do their own thing. But certainly, you know, we are responsible for being stewards of taxpayer money. We also represent all citizens which have an interest in this, are impacted by our judicial system, and should be interested in terms of how it's performing. Uh, so these are just top line measures that we would adopt as a scorecard. Um, at the last meeting, there was a request that I go sit down and meet with the justice officials who desired that. Um, 
I made that offer. I met with the public defender, the sheriff, and the chief chief judge and the superior court administrator on Tuesday of last week with um, Mr. Adams, uh, and, as well as my chief of staff, uh, the public defender, uh, voiced his support for it. The sheriff had no objections. At that particular point in time, uh, she, uh, Judge Glanville, the only concerns that he expressed was that he would like for the resolution to note that these were more aspirational standards, those modifications were made, uh, and that there be more context added to the resolution to point out um, why we were where we were, i.e. I, the pandemic, some of the stuff with conflict attorneys, et cetera, that, that stuff was added to the resolution, um, and I do think it was you know, responsive to their ask. Uh, I didn't receive this, any response back from Judge Glanville, you know, to my revised uh, resolution, which I, draft, which I sent to him uh, last Wednesday until last night. Uh, so um, I think we had a good dialogue. I don't think this necessarily does anything to harm the construct of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. These are just measurements that we would look at and sort of follow. And um, I think they would be good for all parties. We're gonna be able to see the progress, hopefully, that was outlined with a number of the initiatives that are in place by the courts right now. And so I think it's a perfect time for us to start to look at it so we can begin to see the impact and the measurement of that. And I think it would be in the best interest of everybody. All right, anyone else? So Vice Chair, I happen to agree with you. I don't know why anyone would be opposed to uh, meeting uh, standards. Now, as I understand it from you, that there are national standards, aren't there? If there are national standards, I'd certainly want to be measured by, by um, standards to see if judging my own performance. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, when the information, assuming this passes and the information is compiled, who's going to get the information? If we get it, it means nothing. Who? So what's, what's going to be the uh, distribution? This would be distributed to the justice partners, so they would also see it, and the folks in the justice agencies as well as... I think it called for all of the uh, our mayors in our cities. They, they have expressed an interest in this, um, you know, and them seeing it as well. Uh, and I think certainly we should publish it on our uh, on our website and share it through our external affairs channels as well, so that we're you know transparent and public about it. So, Ms. Corbett, can you come up for a minute because this is consistent with what I've asked before when we were uh, tracking the uh, performance of the judges meeting. Uh, what judges are working and what judges are not working. We get those reports, but if we get them, it means nothing. So, and I've been asking for probably more than six months now about a, a plan to distribute that, to disseminate that information. So I think that that's consistent with this. And I'll repeat again, I don't plan to go before the judges, so I'm not worried about being locked up or anything like that. I just think that citizens, if we're gonna do this, and I think we should, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how, get in trouble when I say this. Let's say the million, 500,000 Fulton County residents who watch FGTV, if we can be assured that they're going to get this information so they can see it, I'm fine with it. But short of that, uh, what would be the plan to disseminate this information, which would include which judges are working and which ones are not? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, our Currently, there is a website that includes a a wealth of information about Project Orca. So in addition to the um, information that Mr. Adams shares with this board at these meetings, there is a dashboard that shows um, information by each of the justice agencies as well as the uh, rates by judge of case disposition specifically for Project Orca. I would like to reread re the um, uh, Vice Chair's resolution to understand if this goes beyond that, beyond that, so that we can make sure we have um, all the dashboards. But we have a wealth of information out there today. Um, I think that there's more we can do to make it more accessible or make it um, increase the profile, Mr. Chairman. And so our plan is to use our, our channels to amplify that information, make sure people are aware of it, um, we have done a lot to raise the profile of Project Orca. As you know, it just re, um, was recognized by ACCG as a Georgia County of Excellence program. It will be featured in Georgia Trend in June. Um, so we've done a lot to amplify that. But your specific question about judicial caseloads, I think we can do more to amplify that with our channels. 
But what? Because this is what I've been asking for for six months. I even suggested if it means us taking out a full page ad monthly or weekly to publicize it so the average citizen can see it, it means nothing if we look at it and the Justice Department uh, partners look at it because they're going to throw it in the trash can just as I would. I, I hear you, Mr. Chairman. I, again, we have newsletters. We have, and if you, we, we are not a resource to be able to purchase ads in the paper every week nor do I think that would be the best use of resources to get the eyeballs on this. But I think that we can use our social media channels and other owned channels to do that. And we have a piece that is actually ready to go out now that amplifies the, um, the Project ORCA caseloads. I need to reread the, the, the vice chair's resolution to make sure it also it encompasses everything he's asking for. And I'd like to see a specific plan as okay. to what, because I guess the same thing I've been asking for. But I'll support it today, but I'm telling you, um, I, it's just inside baseball. We'll look at it and go, great, you know, we feel good about it, but who's seeing it? Uh, Vice Chair, I'm sorry, Vice Chair, and then, all right, Commissioner Hall. Thank you. Um, so does the Project ORCA dashboard include cost? Yes, Commissioner, the Project ORCA dashboard includes um, all of the financial resources, human resources, and other information supporting that initiative. Yes, ma'am. The cost for all of that. And, and where, I'll look to Mr. Adams, because I know he's more familiar with that than I am, but yes. The Project ORCA dashboard includes all the cost. We have a, uh, we have a budget. I'm not sure if it's on the, on the official website or not. I don't think it is. Okay, so she said yes, and you just said no. What's the answer? There's, I'm telling you what I know. My, to my understanding, it's not okay. on there. <laughs> you know. Commissioner, no. let me clarify my comment, Commissioner Hall. The information we have has um, includes the budget portion that is allocated. I don't know if it shows the level of cost detail that you're, that you're looking for or that this resolution calls okay. for. But there is certainly budget information about Project ORCA that is on the public dashboard. That I can see. I think maybe you guys need to get together and decide on what's out there. Take another look together and then get a better answer because you're conflicting right now on television. And I, I don't want to continue that conflict. So Me neither. you guys Thank can you. come together and you know check it out and let us know. Um, but that's a major piece. And also... Um, you know, where is the funding going to come from to fund this um, resolution? Uh, Madam CFO, I guess, or Hakeem? There's no funding request for this. There's no funding needed for this? No. Okay, so no funding, no. Okay, that's great. And um, who's asking about judges that are working? Who's asking the judges about this? That was a report that we, uh, several months ago, uh, we did a, what do you call it, uh, a study, I suppose, a pretty exhaustive study. Where is Did, that study? Is, isn't it published monthly? Well, we no. have on our website yeah. the number website. of dispositions by judge, yeah. uh, superior court, state court judges, as well as their uh, existing caseload. Has that been sent to all of us on the Board of Commissioners? It's on our website. It's not one of the things that so we present. So the answer is no, it hasn't been sent to us? It's just on the website? The answer is it is available on the website if you decide to go look there, yes. Right. See, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. that is your point, yeah, actually, yes, point. the accessibility of the information. Okay, well, thank you. All right, Vice Chair Ellis. Uh, Commissioner Barrett. I just have a question uh, <clears throat> for clarification, and I know that it, I could probably do a grid and figure this out myself, but you may know this already, Vice Chair Ellis, without me having to do that. So I'm looking at this list of um, uh, from today's presentation that uh, Alton Adams did with all of the pieces of data that um, are already available and already being reported on. What are the differences? What are the additional pieces that you've added here? Well, I don't know if there were additional pieces or not. I don't think that he had 
clear information around uh, the percentage of felony cases disposed within particular time frames, that standard as well as the clearance rate. I think those are the three measures which uh, were not clear within this report. But you know, this more specifically is to put five top line measures in there that we would see and follow. Here's where we are. To, here's where we are as of this point in time. Maybe we have some sort of historical look back at it, and here's where we're here's where we're going, you know. And we report on that over time and what they look at. But those three, if you look in the data, uh, clearance rate for criminal cases, the felony cases disposed within 180 days, and the felony cases disposed within 365 days. That specific information was not contained within today's report. Am I correct on that, Mr. Adam? That's specific level of detail? Uh, that is correct. OK. Um, OK, I, I, I guess I sort of, you know, gave my thoughts about this at the last meeting as well, which is that, you know, I think we have a lot of data available. And I don't, um, you know, I, I, I feel compelled to stand with our justice partners and allowing them to um, do their jobs without this level of interference. So I'm not going to support this. Uh, any other comments? All right, the motion on the floor, motion to approve by Commissioner Vice Chair Ellis. It is seconded by Commissioner Thorne. Please vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, four yeas, two nays. Next item. Ms. Corbett, you need that information, your plan. Continuing on page 10. Commissioner's full board appointments, 230355, Hospital Authority of Fulton County. Vice Chair Ellis nominates the following slate to be submitted for appointment to one individual to the Board of Trustees of the Hospital Authority of Fulton County to fill the unexpired term of Dr. Thomas Gable, Dr. Kenneth Kupke, Dr. Mark Sunshine, and Dr. Jennifer Emerson. All right, the motion on the floor is to approve by Commissioner Ellis. It's seconded by Commissioner Barrett. Any comments? So I requested certain information, uh, and each of you had, I think we should have received a list of uh, the questions and information that I requested. Uh, Vice Chair Ellis was kind enough to offer his assistance because we had gotten absolutely nothing from them until his involvement. We did get, I want to say, responses, not answers. And I make a distinction between a response and an answer. And what I asked for, we received. But I still do not know what this organization does after reading uh, the documents. The bylaws, if you read it, uh, they meet quarterly. They meet, someone makes a motion to go into executive session. They come out of executive session, no old business, no new business, and they adjourn. If they do take any action after uh, executive session, it's to approve the slate of officers, number one, or number two, to uh, sign a new lease. That's it. So I still do not know uh, what they do. I asked for a, do you have a bank account? Yes, we do. But there's nothing, zero money in the bank account. So I'm still at a loss as to what they do. But if, if y'all want to approve it, go ahead. I won't stand in the way of it. But, I, but in fact, I guess the only thing to do is to invite them down here like every other authority we invite down and we can ask them. Uh, and then the other point that I'd like to make, Fulton, and even though our name is on it, um, our only involvement responsibility to this entity is to submit them a name. And now, what happened today with Commissioner Ellis submitting names to them, that is, I understand what he did, and that's tricky, but, it, it, but it's <laughs> consistent with the law where we are submitting the names rather than them submitting names to us and we just approve them. Right? It's a little sleight of hand, but it still complies with what the, what the law says. So I'm, I'm OK with that. But I still do not know uh, what they do. All right, the motion on the floor is to approve. You, you want to be heard, Vice? All right, the motion on the floor is to approve. And at some point, I want to ask him to appear before here. Well, the other point I do want to make, it's, a, it's, a, it's an authority, therefore approved by the state. The, our only involvement is to provide uh, names to them periodically to fill seats on that board. If we have no other involvement, then I'm prepared to ask the state 
to remove us from it. The entity is there in case they need some financing. Uh, by removing us from the nominating process doesn't affect that. So I got to explore that. that. That's my thinking now. So Vice Chair. Amplify that last point is really why you see their little activity is there's little to be done. I mean, they renew the lease and they they stand in existence so that they can be, you know, an, an issuer of, yeah. of financing, but they don't have anything outstanding. So uh, I don't think there's any mystery to it. I just don't think that there's anything to do and it's just an entity that they keep established because they want that flexibility. And you're correct. If we wanted it changed, there would need to be a, we couldn't change it. There would need to be a change in state law. And if that wanted to be effective, I'm sure they wouldn't have any objection to it. So. And the other thing, if you, if you look at it, each of you should have received the answers that he sent to me. And uh, Caesar Mitchell, our good friend, he's at every meeting. So I'm saying, is he the attorney for them? He's but, the counsel for the authority. For the authority. Yeah. But they I have no money that. in the bank account. I, I don't understand what, what's going on. I mean, he's no. not doing this pro. I mean, he could be doing it pro bono. But they specifically said, when I asked, you know, bank account, yes. And they, I didn't ask how much. They volunteered nothing in the bank account. Well, how's Mitchell being paid? Any, any motion on the floor is to, is to approve. Let's vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, five yeas, one nay. Next item. Bottom of page 11, commissioner's presentation and discussion items, 230357. Chief Tax Appraisal Update regarding 2023 assessment, sponsored by Vice Chair Ellis. Vice Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd ask Mr. Conley, our uh, uh, Chief Assessor, to uh, to join us this, this afternoon, uh, really just to provide us with an update. And, you know, we're, we're hitting that point in time where um, the tax season is upon us. Uh, so I know a lot of times we, you know, we, very frequently, the assessments go out around Memorial Day because I know that my holiday has been disturbed on many occasions around Memorial Day when people have been received of their assessments in some years a little bit more than others. So I was curious about an update. Uh, I thought an update was in order for all of us uh, where we're at in terms of the, the release of the assessments, when they would be sent out. Um, and we had some you know, new exemptions this year, so I'd be interested to in, ask for a status and progress on the processing of those. Um, what sort of information could be brought at first in terms of changes and trends in assessments, um, and then sort of the preparation for communication and customer service measures for to help us citizens understand their assessments and rights of appeal, which inevitably all of us are going to get those questions, um, and then thoughts around anticipated appeal volume and um, you know kind of how we're planning to work the process for. Um, generating the digest, which we know is all, not just the tax assessor's role, but it's a joint role between the tax assessor and the tax commissioner. So I appreciate Mr. Connolly being willing to come down and give us, give us an update on those issues. Good afternoon, Chairman, uh, Vice Chair, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Roderick Connolly. I'm the uh, Chief Appraiser for the Fulton County Board of Assessors. Roderick, Roderick? Roderick, Roderick. How do you spell it? R-O-D. E R I C K. I was invited to provide an update on the 2023 assessment process. To date, staff has completed the work of land package, which include combinations and splits. Uh, they process a little over a thousand land packets this year. Uh, staff has entered um, a little over 44,000 transfers. They process a little uh, about 22,000 homestead applications. They worked about 23,000 permits. Of those permits, about 4,000 were new construction. The personal property division processed about 14,000 personal property returns, which would be an account of new and closed businesses. Currently, staff is in the process of auditing the quality control portion to ensure the accuracy of our values. This process did not come without challenges. Uh, our two main challenges was that of uh, the mapping and the deed processing and that of the application of homestead process, uh, mainly because the process is manual. However, we have been in discussions with county leadership in order to identify some solutions 
So we're looking forward to a better uh, outcome moving forward. Procedurally, the board of, after the Board of Assessors approved the value, uh, those values are provided to the Tax Commissioner's Office for the purposes of auditing and balancing. They're also responsible for the distribution to the other taxing authorities to include the county. Uh, the distribution to the county would be by way of the county manager. Sales and reported increased rates of leasehold square footage indicate an appreciation in the market. Residentially, uh, concentration of new construction has been found in the north and the south ends of the county, while additions and remodel concentration was found in the city of Atlanta. Commercially, market data indicated the following categories suggest an adjustment. Offices, industrial, hospitality, apartments, and retail. I welcome an opportunity to come back to you guys at a future date to offer you more specifics as it relates to the digest. Historically, appeals have fluctuated over the last three years as high as 25,000 in 2001 and as low as a little uh, less than 18,000 um, last year. As it relates to the notices, uh, we do plan on uh, advertising on our website uh, when, we, when that is uh, finalized, uh, but we want to add some modifications, something new that will help taxpayers understand a little better about our process and how we go about valuing property. So we're going to include an appraisal methodology tab, and it gives them an explanation of how we go about valuing our properties. Uh, as it relates to the appeals, once identified, we're going to display that deadline of the appeals process um, on our website. But more importantly, um, what we are probably, what I'm most excited about is an enhancement to our website. Um, we're going to offer a comp search tool, um, and what it does is put the taxpayers and the Board of Assessors uh, on the same platform as it relates to being able to provide comps um, as they work through the appeals process. It is our intentions to put a test site on our website in the next week or so, um, but I want to uh, make sure you know that uh, that test site would only have the 2022 data. Once the notices go out, it will become live with the new data for 2023. Legislatively, we have until July 1st to uh, mail the notices, um, but we are targeting a date of June 23rd to uh, send notices in the mail. Uh, last but not least, we are starting communication with uh, the Tax Commission's Office and other stakeholders as it relates uh, to the submission of the digest and preparation of. No, I appreciate the update. So June 23rd is a, is, a tar is your current target. Um, and I'm just sort of curious, has that, that been shared with the management team? We're kind of working out our own schedule with what that potentially might look like in terms of working back through that whole, when the digest then might potentially be ready and uh, discussion around millage rates, et cetera, kind of thing. Have we really gotten to that level yet, just yet? Or was that the first time you'd sort of gotten a firm date on the, or target date on the notices? <laughs> Uh, that's the first that I've heard. Uh, okay. I'm not sure if it was shared in our last tax team meeting, which okay. um, which I missed. But we'll take that information and um, work work towards having an understanding of when we might be coming back to the board okay. with the proposed millage rate based on that. Okay, fair enough. And then, but in terms of percentages around any of the trends with increases in assessments on the residential front for. Um, existing properties and that sort of stuff, do you have any rough data right now? That you... uh, I don't, again, it may just be a little too premature. Again, the, the most important process for me is gonna be that auditing the quality control. So okay. um, I'm a little hesitant to offer that. Okay, in the commercial categories you noted, I think you almost noted almost all of them, but um, you, were, you were highlighting those as being areas that um, might be more outliers in terms of need of Jumps in assessment, or that where you were highlighting well, that? I'll probably just say most notable, uh, but those okay. are the ones that indicated. Uh, okay. 
All right. Okay. Fair enough. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, Mr. Connolly. Appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Clark, do we have any other items? I think we have some but, for items from executive session. Yes, Vice Chair. There are two items from executive session for, ash, for action by the board. Um, the first is, uh, is there a motion to approve the request for representation in the matter set forth in item number one of the executive session agenda? Got a motion and a second. Let's vote. And the vote is open. And the motion passes, four yeas, zero nays. And second, is there a motion regarding item three of the executive session agenda to approve the request for authorization for the chairman to execute a termination of an IGA lease agreement with the Atlanta Fulton County Recreation Authority after same is approved as to form by the county attorney with the notation that this IGA previously terminated by operation of law, but a formal termination is being provided at this time for the purpose of clearing title record. Favor of motion in a second. Let's vote. The vote is open. And the motion passes, five yeas, zero nays. No further action items from executive session. Any, any other items? No further items. All right, hearing none, meetings adjourned. For a written transcript of this meeting, or if you need reasonable accommodations, including this communication in an alternative format due to disability, please contact the clerk to the commission's office at 404-612-8232.